ahead, Bill. You're on. Super. Well, welcome everybody to the 2021 Yale Innovation Summit. We're virtual this year. We we missed you last year. Um, we have a tradition of promising beautiful weather in New Haven on a May day, and today's no exception. Um, hopefully, we'll all see you next year live back in New Haven. But we've got a great uh, four afternoons planned for you this week. Um, this is pitch day one, um, and the topic's biotech, uh, pharmaceuticals, and biotherapeutics. Over the next two and a half hours, you're going to see 12 great pitches from Yale professors, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, other folks in, in the state of Connecticut that uh, uh, have come together to uh, share their stories about their uh, startups. Um, we have got a great group of uh, industry judges that you're going to meet in a second. And uh, a special thanks to our, uh, our moderators today, Catherine Doyle. Um, from Saul Ewing is going to be moderating the first group of six uh, pitches. And, um, and David Harberger of, of Greenberg Traug is going to be moderating the second group. Um, both of these folks have spent so much time with our entrepreneurial uh, um, in innovators at Yale, helping them uh, with their intellectual property and with their strategies for their companies. And, and we're really grateful for their support here today. Um, so here's the overview. We've got the uh, first hour of pitch block one. Uh, we'll meet the uh, judges beforehand and jump right into it. And then there'll be a little bit of a half time where the judges will uh, share their thoughts on what they heard and uh, maybe uh, share some stories about what's going on out in the industry. Um, then we'll hear uh, the next six pitches, pitch block two. And at the end, uh, you're not going to want to miss this. The, uh, the judges are really going to discuss uh, um, kind of a, a real analysis of everything they've seen at the end. So just so that everybody knows, um, these pitches are five minutes, not any longer. Um, you'll be timed. Um, we've done this enough on campus that everybody knows uh, how, to, how, to, how to do it. Um, here's the first six. Um, and we're really grateful to have uh, quite a diversity of different types of companies uh, uh, from established companies to uh, new ideas for startups. And here's pitch block two. Um, so we have, got, we have a great lineup for you today. Um, I think you're gonna have a lot of, uh, you're gonna have a lot of fun watching all the pitches and hearing the Q and A. Um, as I mentioned, there'll be a really cool wrap up session where the judges will really uh, kind of get into depth about uh, some of the trends in the industry, what's going on, how it relates to some of the things they saw today. Um, they'll be thinking about which things they want to give awards to, but um, um, but the audience will also get a chance to uh, to chime in as well. Um, uh, ask some questions uh, of the judges and get those questions answered. And uh, I think then... Uh, uh, here are the prizes that our judges will be making decisions on. These prizes will be announced on Friday. So it's a little bit of a teaser to get you to join us on Friday. Um, not, too, not too bad for our five, minute, uh, five minutes of work to, uh, to win $6,000 perhaps. But uh, you, the audience, will also be able to um, decide who you think is cool and uh, deserves a prize. And there will be for each of the pitch blocks, um, you can get right on, look at your, uh, look at your tab over in your, uh, your meeting uh, uh, selections over there on, this, on the left side. You can go down to viewer's choice and then right on uh, the screen will pop up and you'll be able to uh, click on which one you want to uh, vote for. So uh, that's a $750 prize for, uh, for the audience selection out of each pitch block. So uh, that's, that'll be a lot of fun. Don't forget to do that. So a uh, little reminders, if you're on a, on a different browser uh, and uh, you might wanna shift over to Chrome, uh, that might give you a better experience. Um, uh, Mac users don't use Safari, that doesn't work out. So, um, but uh, otherwise, um, there's a lot going on other than just watching the show here. You can check out our pitch video showcase. We have nearly a hundred uh, companies uh, of all stages. Some of these are from ideas for new companies 
to uh, a number of established companies in New Haven and in Connecticut uh, from Connecticut Innovations or from uh, Yale alumni and some of our community partners have even uh, joined us. So we're really grateful to have so much interest and enthusiasm. Uh, this is really the, the most inclusive uh, summit that we've ever been able to do. Um, and also we have people joining us from all around the world today. Um, Welcome to the uh, people who are up really late at night in Japan who said they were all joining. Uh, we have people in Europe who are joining us as well. So, um, so enjoy. So let's, I think we're gonna jump and get our, uh, get our, uh, our first moderator, Catherine Doyle and our judges to uh, turn on their cameras and go live with us and, uh, Catherine, maybe you could introduce yourself first. Uh, I've been at Yale a long time and you've been serving us that entire time. So I don't mean to give anything away about your age, but thank you so much for so many years of great service to Yale. And uh, I'll let, uh, I just encourage each, each judge to just uh, tell us your name and uh, where you're from and something interesting about yourself or your firm. Take it away, Catherine. All right, thanks so much, Bill. And as Bill said, I've been working with Yale a very long time, but but no aspersions on my uh, on my age. I'm a patent attorney at Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lear. Um, I'm the head of the life sciences group there. I have a PhD in virology, and actually, Bill, you may not know this, but I was a postdoc at Yale a very long time ago. So New Haven is a little bit of home to me. Um, I work with a fabulous team of people. Some of the Presenters know them, Domingo Silva, Brian Landry, Justin Crotty. Um, and we have a lot of other people that work with us to help Yale in uh, developing strategy for their IP and, and helping start some of these wonderful companies. Um, I will say it is an absolute pleasure to be able to do this. Uh, virtual is not the best uh, forum, but that you guys have been able to get this on is, is uh, a testament to your dedication to the whole entrepreneurship that's going on at Yale. And I am simply delighted to be able to do this. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. So I encourage everybody to just hop on. Allison, you want to go? Sure, happy to. Allison Renderly, I'm a principal here at KKR. So very, very nice to connect today. I think our firm is best known in our histories in private equity, but over the last uh, 10 years or so, we've been spending a lot of time in biopharma. So look forward to, to hearing all the, the pitches today. All right, and who's next? Just jump in there, anybody who's next. I could go next. So uh, I'm Christine Brennan. Uh, I'm a partner at Emerald Ventures Fund, which is the corporate venture arm of uh, US Merck. Um, neuroscience uh, background initially, and then lots of business development and corporate strategy before jumping into ventures and uh, looking forward to hearing everybody's pitch. Super, Henji? Hingy, you're on mute. You're on mute, Hingy. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Hingy Su. Uh, I'm a partner at Nest Bio Ventures. Uh, we're based in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we're a small fund uh, that focuses primarily on seed stage uh, uh, biotech uh, companies. And uh, I uh, uh, actually was a graduate uh, from Yale Medical School years and years ago, so certainly uh, familiar with uh, New Haven as well, and uh, very honored to be here. Jason, anybody? Just jump in, anybody who's next. Jason Haffler, Sanofi Ventures. We're the cor strategic corporate fund for Sanofi. Looking forward to the pitches. It is great to see some fun, friendly faces here that I haven't seen for the Debs in New Hampshire and, and Christine's and Brian's, even though your backgrounds seem much more exotic than my, my tiny little home office. Um, the only fun fact I'd say, I, I am the only person in my immediate family that actually does not have an affiliation to Yale. I was not smart enough. So it's uh, always fun to uh, to be back on a campus, which is very familiar to the family, except for me, because I'm, I'm actually the black sheep of the family. 
I'll jump in next, Jason. Uh, good to see you and a, a whole bunch of also familiar faces. I'm Deb Palestran. I'm a partner at 5AM Ventures. Um, I am a biochemist by training and have been uh, in big pharma doing uh, x-ray crystallography and also in company creation at Third Rock doing uh, startups like uh, Blueprint Medicines and Editas Medicines and also uh, doing corporate development in young new Series A companies. Um, at 5 a.m., I head up what's called 459, which is new company creation. And uh, 5 a.m. is early, 459 is even earlier. So we like to partner with academics and entrepreneurs to uh, help build companies from scratch and, and get them ready for Series A and then hopefully, hopefully lead a, a Series A. Um, and I, how about I just call out the next person, uh, Marion. <laughs> oh, she was on. Brian. Thanks, Deb. Hi, everyone. Brian Gallagher. I'm a partner with Abingworth uh, based in Boston. Abingworth is a transatlantic firm that's been investing in life sciences since the early 70s with offices in London, in Boston and uh, in the Bay Area. And we do everything from company creation, seed series A, so very early stage to late stage phase three, publics and privates. So it's great to see all of you and organic chemist by training. We'll go next, hey everybody, Carla Rosito, I'm a partner with Burson Ventures. We are a, uh, a seed and series A focused uh, biotech firm focused uh, entirely on therapeutics. Um, I'm based in New York, been with the firm for about eight years and trained as a virologist. And Carla, I'm jealous, you actually look like you're in an office. Advantage of being able to walk to work in New York. Yeah. I can go in next. Uh, Elliot Tucker, I'm from Arch Venture Partners. I work for an incredible team of people that have been uh, creating and backing early stage science for the past 35 years and created some of the most um, impactful biotherapeutic companies along the way. I look forward to the cool science today and a um, bit of Fun fact about me, I was shortlisted, but ultimately rejected by the Yale School of Business in 2016. So <laughs> trying, to, trying to give back to the community. OK, is there anybody left who has not introduced themselves? Oh, Marion, you got to turn your turn your. Yes, off. hi, Marion Nakata with Johnson & Johnson uh, Innovation, JJDC, Johnson & Johnson's Corporate Venture Group. We invest in pharma, device, and consumer. Super. And you can rename yourself so people can see you. Yes. From NJ, so that'd be great. And I think with that, I think all of our judges have introduced themselves. Last call. Um, so, uh, then I will let Catherine take it away. Catherine's going to be taking us uh, through the, the six, uh, the six uh, presenters and our judges are going to be, we have companies of all different stages here. So our company, our judges are going to be a little bit stage agnostic and just be looking for what's the most sort of exciting thing that you see today, given the stage that it's at, right? So... Very simple. We're looking for, you know, what's kind of what's kind of fun and exciting that stands out um, for the stage that it's at. So, uh, Catherine, where are you? You there? There you are. Okay. I don't hear you, Catherine. You can take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Bill. So, starting off, pitch block one is going to be Tim Seagart with Alex Therapeutics. Um, Tim, it's all yours. Excellent. Well, thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, uh, Bill, for having me. Looking forward to kicking off things here at the Yale Innovation Summit. So um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Catherine, can you confirm? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, excellent. So happy to be presenting you today with uh, the story of Alex Therapeutics. We're a, a small startup biotech company spun out of Yale here. Um, we're aiming to protect synapses to treat neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so here, here's our founding team. Uh, the science was all founded by uh, Professor Steve Stripmatter. Um, he's a, a professor of neuroscience and neurology at the Yale School of Medicine and director of uh, the Yale Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. You'll also be hearing about one of his other companies, Renetics Next. 
Um, our CEO is Steve Block. Uh, he's a general partner emeritus from Canaan Partners. Uh, we have Paul Fontaine, who you'll also be hearing from later. Um, as a real key business and strategy advisor, he's a former CEO of Boring Ingelheim in the US. Uh, myself, I wear quite a few different hats here at Alex Therapeutics, uh, running our operations, as well as a, a Blavatnik fellow here within Yale OCR. I'm a chemical biologist by training. And then rounding out our founding team is Kevin Malabisky, who's a regulatory advisor, has been assisting us as we progressed our lead program uh, from the preclinical development all the way now into his phase one trial. Uh, so again, we're focused on neurodegeneration, and one of the biggest uh, indications within that group is Alzheimer's disease. There's almost 6 million patients here in the U.S. with Alzheimer's disease. About 40% of those are in the mild cognitive impairment stage. We really think uh, we're trying to target our therapeutic development early in disease where there's a chance to intervene and have positive outcomes. And importantly, there's currently no disease-modifying therapies available uh, to treat Alzheimer's that uh, can be used by patients. So Alzheimer's is a, a tricky space for development. I think we're all familiar with a, a lot of the, the key readouts in, in data lately in Alzheimer's. And really, we, we have our core tenets of Alex that we really feel are on the clinical path to developing disease-modifying Alzheimer's therapies. First is we want to target synapse loss. As, this, uh, as a requirement for a disease-modifying therapy, we really feel it as though synapse loss is the underlying driver of disease progression. We wanted to conduct animal studies in a manner that best model human disease progression and also use uh, clinical treatment paradigms that uh, try to replicate this mild cognitive impairment stage of disease and not just use one animal model, but use many and validate that multiple times. Um, third is that we intend to utilize pet imaging biomarkers as a powerful means to de-risk clinical development and validate our mechanism of act action early in the clinical trial. And then throughout this process, leverage non-dilutive grant funding from the NIH at each, each step. This allows us to remain capital efficient and maximize investor equity and returns as we progress. So a little bit about our lead program, ALX001. It's an MGLUR5 silent allosteric modulator program. MGLUR5 is a transmembrane uh, glutamate receptor that's essential for cognition. It's also the central receptor for pathophysiological synapse dysfunction and synapse loss as outlined by our founder, Steve Stripmatter. Uh, our compounds and, and, and class of therapies are unique in that they're silent with regards to glutamate signaling through this receptor. Uh, this preserves normal synaptic physiology, but we, we are able to do is bias our activity to only block this uh, and rescue the Alzheimer's disease pathophysiology, which is signaled through MGLUR5 as a result of A-beta oligomers and prion protein signaling. So our lead program um, is, is part of an in-license portfolio from Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, it's highly potent and selective small molecule. It's preferentially delivered to the brain. We have a solid oral formulation that we expect would support once daily dosing in animals or in humans. I, I mean, um, we validated this in three different mouse models of Alzheimer's. We have a wide therapeutic window and we can validate that with primate receptor occupancy study. Uh, and we have an active IND, which was successfully launched in March of 2021. And the phase 1A study in healthy volunteers is currently underway at the Yale Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, so a little bit about the mechanism of action and, and efficacy of our drug. Uh, we actually see a restoration of learning and memory deficits in mouse models of Alzheimer's uh, that's driven by this reversal of synapse loss. So here is an aged APP PS1 mouse. We wait to initiate treatment until the mice are symptomatic with Alzheimer's disease and treat with our drug for a month. And what we see is a rescue of memory deficit. Here in the gray bar, as you can see that the, the mice don't remember a novel object versus a familiar one. Um, but when we treat with our drug, we now are able to uh, restore the wild type phenotype. This is driven by a restoration of synapses in the brain over one month of treatment. And importantly, all of this is independent of A-beta plaque reduction in the brain, We're really targeting this underlying mechanism of synapse loss here. As I mentioned, one of our other core tenants of, of Alex is to leverage imaging technologies in our ongoing phase 1A. We're using an MGLUR5 PET agent uh, to look at receptor occupancy and predict therapeutic concentration. And as we move forward through our, our critical phase 1B and phase 2 studies, we'll leverage PET imaging agents that allow us to actually track the synapse loss process over time. Uh, so we can really pro prove our mechanism that we're restoring synapses with our drug. Uh, so that's the, the brief five minute overview. You know, Alex Therapeutics here, again, we're, we're focused on neuronal synapse protection and rescue. 
Uh, we have a distinct mechanism of action independent from A beta and tau lowering technologies. Our pathway is linked to GWAS Alzheimer's disease risk variant. And we have an expedited and capital efficient path towards clinical proof of concept, uh, which we really feel will be a, a great outcome, uh, not just for the company, but also for patients. So happy to take any uh, questions with the remaining time here. Thanks very much, Tim. So we've got um, three minutes uh, for questions from our judges. Anybody want to kick it off? Yeah, happy to. Hi, it's Marion. Uh, very exciting, Tim. And uh, Alzheimer's is, is in a, a space that uh, obviously Jansen's very interested in. Is this a single asset company? It, and and um, and what are your thoughts about how how and when you will find a partner? Because I don't think you're thinking that you'll obviously take this into to pivotal studies. So those are my yeah, two questions. Right. So so right now, you know, I think the the the, the lead program here is this MGUR5 silent allosteric modulator. There, there will likely be some, some other technologies. There's, there's a polymer from Steve's lab that's, that's interesting as well. Uh, I think really the critical path is uh, proof of concept in the clinic, especially when it comes to partnering with a, a pharma company that might be able to run a large phase three trial. Um, we're really trying to get through this proof of concept uh, to show potentially synapse restoration in the phase 1B study Got it. using these PET imaging biomarkers, which are very exciting and, and developed by uh, the Yale PET Center here as well. And that would be when a partner would be, I, I guess, intrigued. But for right now, it's just really focusing on this asset, correct, as opposed to a, a, a portfolio of assets. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Tim, can I just follow up on that? Do we know um, how much uh, synapse restoration is clinically meaningful in a human and what, what we're sort of targeting there? Yeah, so I, I think uh, one, of, one of the key targets for us is, is not just synapse restoration, but I think a, a slowing in the, the loss of synapses over time will provide a meaningful outcome um, in slowing disease progression. So um, there are um, natural history studies that look at synapse loss over time in Alzheimer's disease patients. Uh, so we really feel if we can, if we can target this 30% slowing in the rate of synapse loss over a one-year trial, um, that's going to be an excellent outcome for us. In the 1B, which is, you know, a one-month study, uh, we're not going to see that slowing in disease progression. We'd look for a reversal of synapse loss, which we've seen in all animal models that we've, we've treated with this drug. Uh, you know, synapse restoration, I think, is a, a grand slam. Uh, synapse preservation is, is really the main goal. Excellent. Thank you. Other questions? I want one very question. interesting. Oh, sorry, Christine. Go ahead. Oh, oh okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> one quick one. Um, you mentioned the PET ligand in terms of, uh, of looking at those synapses and being able to also do receptor occupancy. Is uh, the plan also to use that for patient selection, or is this sort of an all comers for your for your initial uh, POC? Um, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I think we're we're definitely aiming to confirm. Alzheimer's disease patients and patients using MMSC scores that are in this mild cognitive impairment stage. Um, late stage dementia where there's likely extensive uh, neuronal degradation and neuron loss is probably too late for, for seeing a meaningful impact. Uh, so we're really trying to stage these patients in this MCI stage. So I'm gonna ask the, the rest of the people to hold questions and, and maybe talk to Tim offline because in an effort to stay on track so Tim doesn't shoot me. I think we need to move <laughs> to the next one. But, and that's not you, Tim Seegert, it's Tim <laughs> Good, thank, thank you. Thank you no, I think you're doing great, thanks. Really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, so next up is Erica Smith, who's gonna tell us about uh, Renetics. You're up, Erica. All right, can you hear me and can you see my screen? We can do both. All right, we're hitting it out of the park already. All right, well, thank you for welcoming me here today uh, to share our important and also exciting opportunity. So Thanksgiving day, Mark was driving home at the end of his shift and looking forward to a belly full of turkey and stuffing with his wife and two kids. Suddenly his car was hit from behind, crushing him into an exit barrier. When the jaws of life cut him out of the vehicle, he was paralyzed from his neck down. 
simple tasks like brushing his teeth, buttoning his shirt, or feeding himself were impossible. His, my, his wife is now his full-time caregiver. Our company, Renetics Bio, is boldly taken on the challenge of developing a treatment for Mark and the millions of others suffering from debilitating neurological conditions, such as spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, and blindness from optic nerve damage. We've raised $30 million to date, have launched first in human clinical trials, and have the support of a global biotech and are actively expanding a multi-billion dollar pipeline of opportunities. So what is the problem we're solving? Axons are the long thread-like parts of neurons and they carry communication signals across the nervous system. And when the axons in the brain or the spinal cord or even the optic nerve are damaged by disease or injury, the loss is permanent. So we protect and reverse axonal loss. Our solution is based on breakthrough research at Yale Inhibitory proteins on myelin, shown here in blue, bind to neuron receptors, shown here in orange, preventing axonal regrowth. We temporarily disrupt this binding using our lead molecule, AXR204. And when we stop inhibition, axons sprout, synaptic plasticity increases, and new connections are built around damaged axons. As a visual validation of our mechanism, we're sharing actual images of the optic nerve following a crush injury. The first image is with no treatment, as, as expected, there is no regrowth. However, the second two images show the regrowth of axons with our therapy. So addressing axonal loss is a huge unmet need for patients, a significant market opportunity across ophthalmology and neurological conditions, and current therapies in, uh, attempt to reduce damage by limiting insults such as lowering interocular pressure or minimizing inflammation. But there are no approved treatments for addressing axonal loss. So unlike other approaches, in stopping inhibition, we allow for axonal growth. We're encouraged by the validation of our approach and the results have been published in top tier peer reviewed journals, including impressive results recently of axonal growth and functional recovery in non-human primate and we even highlighted in the Wall Street Journal just a few weeks ago. Our leadership team was built with a commitment to address these devastating conditions with expertise across leading companies. Our advisors include our scientific founder from Yale, Dr. Steven Stripmatter, as well as the chair of ophthalmology from Stanford University. And my personal journey has been as an industry executive and investor over the last 15 years, managing key seed investment funds through Johnson & Johnson and at Yale. And four years ago, as the inaugural director of the, the director of the Blavatnik Fund, I presented awards at the Yale Innovation Summit. And today the story is flipped and I'm so proud and excited to share the advancement of one of Yale's leading companies. So we've continued to de-risk our approach and recently completed a single ascending dose study in 24 patients with chronic cervical spinal cord injury. There were no serious adverse events, encouraging efficacy and translational biomarkers of, of target engagement and axonal growth. And with this information, we've launched a repeat dose placebo controlled study that is powered as a proof of efficacy, um, proof of concept for efficacy with a major inflection point given data readout in early 2022. So we have a rich pipeline of indications, regulatory engagement with FDA fast track designation and are actively pursuing breakthrough therapy based on the unmet need and preclinical and clinical evidence. And notably, our regulatory advisor led the, the strategy for breakthrough therapy as part of the $1 billion acquisition of a Killian by Alexion. So to summarize our opportunity, we're addressing a completely unmet need, a novel approach to axonal loss by stopping inhibition across neurology and ophthalmology indications, we expect to have top line data early next year and look forward to connecting with you today uh, for additional discussions for partnership and fundraising. And my hope is that one day soon, because of our work, Mark will be able to brush his daughter's hair and hold his wife's hand. Come join me. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry. Can you hear me? I, I missed any okay. the question. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm happy to start off, Erica. This is really interesting. Maybe it's a question the regulatory pathway based on your correspondence with the FDA. What is a approvable endpoint look like here? Um, so we're in conversations with the FDA right now and in, in determining of uh, those specific factors. Uh, clearly, there's no never been an approved therapy, so we're you know bridging new ground. Um, so having key uh, regulatory advisors is is key to our success. Um, we're encouraged by the fast track uh, designation that we've already received. We've gotten positive results um, early on in our breakthrough therapy application. And um, because we're working with chronic spinal cord injury and we're working with people with cervical level injury, um, changes, small changes in hand and arm function, we believe are going to be approvable um, endpoints because those have never been able to be improved upon with other therapies and also the activities of daily living and the improvement for quality of life as you know, my example of, of Mark who um, you know, comes to us from you know, an actual example of a patient that we work with. Um, is, is going to be kind of key. Um, the other thing maybe I'll just note, because I'm very excited about this, is we've brought the community along with us. We have advisors of people that lead in the spinal cord um, uh, community that are, are right next to us um, and looking forward to those conversations as well. Other questions? Erica, can you, can you clarify what is the patient population that you're treating in this trial? These are long-term um, injury patients or these are acute? Sure, no, it's an excellent, excellent question. So we know we, are, we, know we can be applicable to both acute and chronic based on our preclinical models. Our design of our, ther of our trial is actually with chronic patients because of the stable baseline and the ability to then uh, impact any change that we're seeing direct to the patients um, in, for improvement. So we have a great natural history database. And uh, so we are, so the, in regards to the, the size of the, the, uh, the population, it's roughly 300,000 people just in the US alone that are suffering for chronic spinal. And then there's another two, uh, 20,000 uh, annually that um, are new, new patients. Erica, for the ophthalmology, is it a different formulation or a different molecule, or is it the same? Super question, Marian. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you asking. It's we well, we have a, we do have a pipeline of other molecules, but it is um, specific uh, is a new as a different formulation. So we have specific IP associated with that, and it is independent and and, and differentiated from what would be required for our spinal okay. cord. Mm -hmm. And that's topical for the eye. It, no, it is an intraocular injection. Intra yeah, Thanks. yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're almost at the end of time, Erica. That was a great talk. I'd, I'd love to talk to you maybe offline about the acute spinal injury versus multiple cirrhosis since they're, they're, they're different uh, sort of pathologies. But thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. I welcome you. Um, our next speaker is Paul Fontaine. And Paul is going to talk to us about Thyron. You're up, Paul. Can you see my slides? Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, we can. And apparently you can hear me. So that's wonderful. Paul Fontaine, startup CEO of uh, Thyron Pharmaceuticals. I'm also joined with uh, Dr. Naftali Kaminsky, our scientific founder, who's also on the line. And we look forward to your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, there's important clues that point to the role of thyroid hormones in critical diseases. Uh, we know that thyroid hormones are critical to homeostasis of the normal alveolus and alveolar flu fluid reabsorption, for example. We also know that it can be protective in uh, rodent models of sepsis and hyperoxia. And we know that supplementing uh, thyroid hormones results in antifibrotic effects in critical diseases. However, as it's well understood, uh, concerns for systemic toxicity exist. In addition, hypothyroidism in humans is associated with poor prognoses in a number of critical diseases, including idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So our solution to approach this, uh, these diseases is a clinical stage, orally available small molecule called sabeterone. It's well characterized. It has been tested in humans, 65 subjects to be exact. And it was well tolerated in the wide dose range for up to uh, 28 days with no dose limiting tox. Uh, the opportunity in front of us stems from 
uh, in part an open IND and the clinical data package I had just made allusion to, as well as a patent estate that Yale has filed for a number of uses, formulations, and dosages. The first indication that we propose to target is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It is a large orphan disease. Just under 200,000 patients suffer from this condition in the U.S. alone. The standard of care, uh, there are two, OFEV and Esbriet, are drugs that sell in a combined over $2 billion a year this year. However, are plagued with significant tolerability and safety, co safety concerns, which result in low treatment and adherence. So our aim and target product profile are to develop subetterone into an effective, safer, better tolerate inhaled delivery medicine for pulmonary fibrosis patients. A rapid path to the clinic may be available to us based on op the open IND that I referenced and the vast tox and safety uh, available on this compound. In addition, uh, there's significant reason to believe that uh, this compound might be efficacious based on preclinical data stemming from Dr. Kaminsky's lab at Yale. Here are some of the clues that come from that uh, work. Uh, in vitro, we know that sabetarone can improve epithelial and fibroblast mitro mitochondrial function. Uh, the in vivo experiment described on the upper right side of my screen shows you that when mice are submitted to bleomycin-induced lung injury, uh, treatment with sabetarone will help them recover to normal thriving and weight, whereas treatment with vehicle will not, and they will continue to, to not develop. We also know from Dr. Kaminsky's extensive uh, lung slices collection that treatment of fibrotic lungs with uh, sabetarone can um, affect markers of fibrotic disease. So we've assembled an experienced team to lead Phyron forward and tackle this opportunity. Dr. Kaminsky is a well-known expert in the field of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Myself led the team that launched the market leader in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, OFEV, in my time as CEO of Beringer Ingelheim USA. Uh, my colleague, Tim Crowder, as startup COO, has over 20 years of inhalation development experience at firms that focused on such development. And our board members span the spectrum from serial entrepreneurs in life sciences, well-known venture capitalists, and well-known R&D expert also in the field of uh, respiratory medicine. Um, and our focus right now is to plan the development of Sabetarone uh, and develop the work packages that you see on your screen and offer uh, a de-risked clinical strategy going forward, as well as better understand the role of Sabetarone in a second indication, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So um, please get to know us. We were just founded. Uh, and just uh, worked with Yale on this particular technology and looking for investors and strategic partners to develop so better on. You see my contact information on the bottom right side of your screen. Thank you. And I look forward to uh, your questions together with Dr. Kaminsky. Thank you so much, Paul. Really uh, appreciate that great talk. Um, questions, opening it up to the, the judges. So for IPF, I assume that this is more for chronic use. So I was wondering if you already have any data on how sabetarone affects the T3, T4, TSH levels and things like that. Naftali, would you like to take that one? I believe there is some of that in the uh, initial database that we have. So there's extensive uh, short-term safety data with sabetarone up to 28 days. It's completely safe. Longer there's issues and there may be um, secondary hypothyroidism. Uh, so Betterum is a thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist, but it causes uh, a decline in TSH. So there may be the loss of T3. These things are, need to be worked. I think our strategy would be targeted therapy, um, either by aerosolized approach or other ways, targeting it to the lung, getting to max. Uh, um, um, 
doses the, the lung, but the potential for systemic therapy, especially for shorter term courses is also a possibility. Got it, thanks. So, so I, I, I guess the question is sort of in terms of your choice of your first indication, why wouldn't you go for something more acute like ARDS or, or whatever, given the nature of you know, what this drug can do? Potentially, we're not uh, excluding that. It's a good question. We're not excluding that, um, but the the commercial potential of the compound is really in chronic therapy, and there is a specific need in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that we all understand really well. And again, by uh, choosing the inhalation route, I think we can uh, circumnavigate the potential toxicities associated with long-term chronic systemic use. Okay, thank you very much. Paul, uh, good to see you. Uh, two, hey, Jason. Two, two questions. First is given the history of Quatrex and all the um, mm -hmm. origins of the compound, have you thought about prodrugging or other strategies to try to get past the seven years uh, from at least the uh, patent pr from, uh, protection? And then second is how much work have you done around formulation, inhalation, how are you gonna deliver it? Cause that's not trivial given um, yeah. The there. Great questions, and uh, based on my background, you can probably believe that I looked at IP a lot. Um, and the um, clearly choosing an inhalation delivery route, and with the expertise that we have on the team, uh, creating the right formulation, there is a significant source of IP that we're working through right now. Uh, with regards to pro drugs, yes, that's on a long list of things to tackle. Uh, but I think we can first uh, do the uh, do some better room and having had experience with very potent compounds uh, in um, in inhalation development, uh, I can tell you that it's it is almost as strong, if not stronger, than a patent if you can develop that formulation and uh, make it clever enough. All right, thanks. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Paul. Thank you. Uh, moving to our next talk, uh, Demetrius Braddock is going to present Net Therapeutics to us. You've got it, Demetrius. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm Demetrius, and I'm here to tell you about the next idea out of the Braddock Lab. Um, the um, Company is formed around the idea to target nets, which are neutrophilic extracellular traps. Nets are formed uh, when neutrophils interact with um, foreign organisms, in this case, Helicobacter, and they extrude their DNA in a self-destructive manner, entrapping the bacteria and causing um, entrapment and um, degradation of the uh, pathogen. Once the nets have been formed, they need to be rapidly degraded. And if they're not, uh, they're associated with uh, a host of diseases. Um, <clears throat> the company is being formed around myself. I'm the scientific founder of Enzyme. I have expertise in enzyme therapeutics. And I um, have worked in the past, uh, notably with Enzyme, uh, founding with Ronaldo Diaz, who's a partner at Longitude Capital, and Gene Griffin, who's a a bio uh, scientist in the community for 30 years. And I worked with Gene when he was at Alexion developing uh, ENPP1 for GACI. Our IP is held by Yale and we work closely with David Lewin and David and I have worked together for 15 years and we've had notable successes with several companies including Pet Petrogen, Precipio and Inazyme. And I think you'll hear from Petrogen a little later today. So why are we treating this now? Well, there is a technological breakthrough we believe in the ability to engineer and uh, optimize biologic therapeutics in the blood. Here is a recent publication from our lab earlier this year in which we optimized an enzyme for an indication that's going into humans next month. Um, and we took it from 37 hours to 204 hours. So this is twice a month dosing in a human with an enzyme biologic. We've done this now with biologics that degrade DNA and nets. And these are our two lead candidates here. Well, I'm showing you purified gels using um, GMP resins and techniques that are scalable and optimizable and readily transferable. And this patent is um, IP is held by Yale, uh, filed by Saul Ewing, and it's um, 
uh, available. So uh, we have characterized the PKPD of our biologics. We dose a mouse at one mg per kg of enzyme under the skin. After 166 hours, we take the plasma, we add either free DNA or chromatin DNA, and you can see that we completely degrade either the free or the chromatin in these four optimized biologics here. So that's about a once a week dose. Our initial indication is gonna be lupus. Now, why lupus? Because humans with DNAs1 or DNAs1 L3 deficiency develop lupus. This is a pediatric form of lupus. It's rapidly progressing. It progresses into renal failure. This is in contrast to the adult's form of lupus which wax and wane. And importantly, the mouse models of these monogenic enzyme deficiencies reproduce faithfully the human disease such that you can get a predictable uh, response in the mice that is predictive of a human response. Uh, why is this of importance? Because it is known and published in such as these papers I cite here that uh, the probability of success for something called protein replacement therapy, which is the technique we're proposing here for lupus, has a 90% probability uh, when it's first in class. And this is in contrast to other uh, drugs which range from 14 to 22%. This probability can go very low in some indications uh, to a discouraging less than 1%. <clears throat> we have validated now that these mice, these knockout mice do develop lupus as shown here. This is a DNA uh, one and one L3 double knockout, which develops antinuclear antibodies, which is the hallmark of lupus within one month of, of age. And we see that that single knockout in 1L3 is about five months of age. Notably, we can suppress the uh, anti-nuclear antibody development in these mice with our uh, therapeutics um, in the small numbers that we've done at one month. And we are continuing to dose and build more and more confidence in our therapeutics. So what our timelines look like is that we're well into the lupus preclinical validation. We have a secondary indication that we've validated biomarkers in. We expect all this to be wrapping up in the first quarter of 2022, at which time we will uh, then uh, engage in a series A um, raise. So in summary, we've developed pri proprietary stable DNA degrading biologics with high potency and bioavailability. We have about a once a week dose at one mg per kg. We have our lead indications that's validating in um, small numbers of animals and we're seeking um, about a half a million dollars in a seed fund to be matched dollar for dollar by CI. And that's the end of my pitch. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Demetrius. Really appreciate it and wish you luck with this next one. Um, questions? I have a, uh -huh. a sorry. Go ahead, Deb. I have a more general question on um, on the IP that you mentioned. Is this um, really focused on the single asset or the, the technology development you mentioned around sort of half-life extension on the biologic itself? Well, there's uh, there's two separate you know, enzyme biologics that we're focusing on, and we have multiple variations of each one of these, um, which are focused on the half-life extension and the optimization. So it's, it's a multi-asset. Um, IP strategy uh, encompassing several different enzymes used in different ways. And, you know, we're, we'll just see which one works the best effectively. And Demetrius, this is great. How much do you know about specificity of target effects with the replacement? Well, you know, enzyme replacement therapy is just very, very safe, right? You often can't get a toxic dose in an animal at any possible dose. And so we've seen this with other enzymes in the past. Um, so this is one of the reasons why they're so effective um, getting through uh, the FDA is the tox is just so um, clean in these, uh, this strategy. Um, and these enzymes as well appear to be very well tolerated, no neutralizing antibodies in the animals and very well um, tolerated by the animals in our hands so, thus far. Maybe one other question, and again, apologies for the naive, I just don't know much about um, DNAs1 and lupus, but um, how much of a correlate, or I guess what is known around that being the fundamental cause of the disease in humans versus just the knockout mice? Sure. Um, lupus more and more is being seen to be driven by nets. And um, in fact, 
the, um, in mouse models, it's not only these enzyme deficiencies that respond to um, uh, DNA biologic, it's also other forms of lupus mouse models like a pristine mouse model, which is a, driven by a, a provocation of a, of a drug to, to develop lupus. This mouse also responds to a gene therapy for, for a DNA swan. Um, so, you know, there's optimism that it might not just be these rare forms of the disease that respond. I wanted to ask about the, the animal model. It sounded like you needed a double knockout to see phenotype. Um, That's not true. No, the double knockout just is faster. The single knockouts develop it later on, five months, six months later. Got it. Okay. That's, that clarifies it. Thanks. Sure. I was curious about the, the fundraise. If you had more money sooner, could you go faster? More money is always better. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I was just wondering, and if you just need more data before you raise the A, because the A is not going to be for another year and a half. Yeah, I mean, we'd like to really get into, um, you know, more data and in, in a couple indications. To, and, you know, the, obviously, if we had more money, we could start to develop the um, the GMP biologic right now, because we're pretty confident that we have the right agent and that would really help us out as well. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. And thank you, Demetrius. Yeah. Um, our next uh, picture is Akansha Bogara, who's gonna talk to us about Virtus Therapeutics. Are you on mute? Thanks, Catherine. Can everyone see my screen and see me now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Sorry about that. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. My name is Akan Varga. I'm one of the current Blavatnik Fellows at the Yale OCR, and I'm excited to be presenting to you on today on behalf of Virtus Therapeutics. Virtus is an early stage pharmaceutical startup which is spun out of the research lab of Dr. Chukri Ben Mamoun, a professor of medicine and microbial pathogenesis here at the Yale School of Medicine. This is the second startup to spin out of Dr. Ben Mamoun's lab, and we've amassed a fantastic team with considerable expertise spanning industry and academia. Our mission is to develop the first treatment for pantothenate kinase associated neurodegeneration or PCAN. This is an incredibly devastating neurodegenerative disease associated with Parkinsonism, dementia, and severe motor dysfunction, resulting in difficulty eating, drinking, swallowing, and breathing properly, all of which can result in premature death. PCAN was first reported in 1922. However, no approved treatments exist to date with current management approaches focused primarily on symptomatic relief. It's an ultra rare disease with a prevalence of one to three out of a million worldwide. And the genetic basis for this condition is very well established. It's caused by a mutation in the pantothene kinase two gene, which is located on chromosome 20. Now to share some background on the pathway and basic biology, Humans have three active pantothene kinases that phosphorylate pantothene or vitamin B5. This is an essential step in the synthesis of coenzyme A, which is an essential cofactor that plays an important role in metabolism. While PANK1 and 3 are cytoplasmic enzymes, PANK2, which is associated with PCAN, is a mitochondrial enzyme and a major active and the major active PANK isoform, which is expressed in the human brain. So herein lies a problem. When PANK2 is missing, you have reduced levels of coenzyme A that results in disruption of the mitochondria in the neurons and disruption of the brain function. Our solution to this is a novel class of activators which were discovered in Chukri's lab that activate human pantothenate kinase 3, which results in increased accumulation of coenzyme A, which consequently restores mitochondrial function, neuronal function, and should restore brain function. Now of the nine compounds we've identified, we found two modes of activation, activity directly at the active site and allosteric activation. And this information, including understanding of the crystal structure, will help us guide drug design. We've identified nine compounds, VTACs one through nine, which were discovered through a large drug discovery program that started back in 2017 and was completed last year. These arose from an initial screen of 156,000 compound library. 12 novel chemotypes were discovered and 415 analogs of these drugs were synthesized. 86 of these analogs represent a single chemotype, PTZ, and we found nine of the PTZ compounds are strong activators of human PANK3 with AC50s between 2.2 and 2.68 nanomolar. Our next steps are basically a series of proposed uh, screening cascades planned for these nine compounds to ultimately identify a lead candidate. 
Uh, first is in vitro characterization of the biological biochemical activity and selectivity of the compounds through a series of biological and cell-based assays, including the biological efficacy in PANK2 deficient cells from patients and engineered using CRISPR technology. We'll evaluate their in vivo activity in both currently available and newly designed humanized PCAN mice models, as well as the evaluation of key pharmacological properties, including their ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. These proposed studies will allow us to identify lead human PANK3 activators that meet predetermined metrics for efficacy and drug ability, and that will ultimately be suitable for clinical development. Now, the market size for this indication is estimated to be 360 million per year from data in the US and UK. And this is from looking at approved therapies and comparable rare diseases. This is likely an underestimate of the overall global market size. And with regards to other applications of this research, there are similarities between children with PCAN and adults with Parkinson, uh, Parkinson and uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we think that understanding this pathway better may lead to insights in other neurodegenerative disease processes. Likewise, given the role that mitochondrial function plays in aging, preserving its function may lead to greater understanding of this process as well. These broader applications are areas we're enthusiastic to explore scientifically in the future. However, our current strategy remains focused on targeting this particular rare disease of PCAN. And competitors in the space have failed largely due to toxicity of the compounds and approaches that fail to address key steps and relevant enzymes in the pathway. In summary, we're a company addressing an unmet need and a devastating disease indication. Our competitive advantage lies in novel activators with novel mode of action, strong IP, and a strategic approach for regulatory approval. In addition, we have broad applications and are currently pursuing non-dilutive funding to advance our R&D. Our goal is to get to a lead candidate by 2022 with an aim to get to a clinical stage asset by 2023. We're open to starting uh, early conversations with partners that are interested in helping us achieve this goal. And hopefully one day we'll finally be able to bring hope and solution to the patients suffering from PCAN. Thank you everyone uh, for this opportunity to present and I'll take any questions now. Thanks very much, Akancha. Uh, questions from our judges? Yeah, I have a, a quick question, a great presentation. Um, is there understanding yet around what, um, if anything, uh, might happen when you sort of overactivate PANK3 systemically? Uh, understanding that obviously you're, you're trying to compensate for the missing PANK2, but just wondering if there's sort of an overstimulation that can happen um, and if anything has been uh, 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 examined on that end. Uh, so far, we haven't seen any issues with overactivation of PANK3. Um, or uh, activating PANK1. Nice presentation. Sorry if I missed it, but is this a is it monogenic disease? Yeah, so uh, this disease is caused by uh, defects in the pantothenic kinase 2 gene. There are over 200 mutations that have been identified. Um, there's, you know, the, the more significant ones which cause a, a loss in function of pan pantothenic kinase 2 are generally associated with the classic form of the disease, which is more severe. And you also see a number of uh, missense mutations resulting in um, the more atypical features, which are less severe and delayed in onset. Uh, thanks so much. This is a really nice presentation. I'm, I'm curious on the, the three different isoforms of, you know, PANK1, 2, and 3. I, I'm just trying to understand what, you know, is there an expression difference or, or do you, in terms of localization, how, how how, can you just help me understand uh, if we would need to get PANK2 specifically upregulated? PANK3, I understand, is, is doing the same job, but it, will it do it in the same place at the same amount um, as would be needed? Yeah. Um, so you're asking, uh, like, how how ex extensive does it increase in in the I guess, yeah, I in guess order if, to increase coenzyme A? Or, or if we understand if uh, PANK3 systemically will, will impact uh, the same way as a, a wild type PANK2 um, person, I guess, in this case. Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're hoping that the accumulation of, so we're hoping that by uh, activating the cytoplasmic enzymes, PANK1 and PANK3, we'll have an accumulation of the coenzyme A that should get to the mitochondria and compensate the loss of the coenzyme A. Uh, and I think looking at other similar, looking at this defect in other systems like yeast systems and zebrafish, um, we think that we can, uh, with a moderate increase in um, complementing the cytoplasmic enzymes, we should see an effect in the mitochondrial matrix where a coenzyme A is deficient. I, I don't know if I answered your question. Sort of, but that's okay. I don't want to take too much time. I'll connect offline with you on it. Thanks. 
driving the hey. toxicity for uh, the competing alternative? Yeah, sure. Um, so there are a number of, of approaches that have been taken. Um, you know, the, the primary one that had a lot of excitement was looking at iron chelating agents. And there was a phase three study, um, uh, phase three study of deferoprone, which looked at 189 patients in a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. And this was 18 months treatment. And they, while they found some moderate improvement in, um, in both iron accumulation in the brain, as well as a decrease in dystonia in these patients, uh, the results weren't statistically significant. And in their long-term safety extension study, they found that these patients had anemia. So this uh, approach has been kind of, is no longer seen as a viable solution. There was a bridge bio compound that also failed due to toxicity and I believe a rabbit model. And there's another approach uh, as well with uh, one of our lead scientific collaborators out of OHSU, which is also kind of, kind of failed in the clinical trials. and. Uh, we think some of the insights we made in this pathway and the other enzymes that play a role may prove why this, this approach isn't working. So currently there's nothing really viable in development. Okay, well, thank you so much, Akansha. That was a, a great talk. And our last pitcher for this first block is Gary Desir, Desir who's gonna talk to us about Vessor Farmer. You're up, Gary. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me or hear, see my slides? Yes. Great. So um, I am presenting on, on, on behalf of Bessel Pharma and uh, Personal Therapeutics, uh, and um, I'm a scientific advisor and co-founder. So what I'm so excited to talk to you about today is Renolase, first in-class drug for treating hyperinflammation in systemic viral infections, COVID-19 and acute uh, organ injury. So uh, renolase is a secreted protein that promotes cell survival and decreases inflammation to define mechanisms. And I'm the discoverer of renolase. As a nephrologist, I was interested in the connection between kidney disease and heart disease, and we discovered renolase. So we've defined its signaling mechanisms, how it works, and we know a lot about it. Essentially, what it does, it allows cells to survive and decreases inflammation. So we believe there's broad opportunities for indications in hyperinflammation and this is what the focus of the talk is today, but also in acute organ injuries, such as kidney, pancreas, and lung, not related to COVID. Uh, we've developed proprietary peptides, which are part of the protein. We've, we've figured out the uh, active portion of the protein, and it's a small peptide that has demonstrated preclinical activity and efficacy. We are, on, we are targeted for an IND in Q1 of 2022. There is a potential for biomarker linked therapeutics, and we are funding from NIH and others. So um, because we, we had shown that renolase decreases inflammation, we wanted to, to look at it in inflammatory states and we're thinking of ARDS, let's say for the flu, and then the COVID pandemic happened. So I'm chairman of medicine at Yale. So my department actually admitted 5,000 patients to Yale with COVID. And we thought it would be a good idea to look at this particular hyperinflammation state. So we use a, a general model of um, hyperinflammation called polyIC, which is a synthetic uh, molecule that engages the receptors that generate hyperinflammation in when double uh, virus, double, double uh, RNA viruses enter the body. So they basically generate NF-kappa B and interferon response. So um, what we showed is that we asked whether or not renalase agonist BP1002 would improve survival if animals are given polyIC. And what we show is that if you take animals that are renalase deficient, knockouts, and you expose them to polyIC, there's a significant mortality, as you can see here, 50% of them die within 40 hours. However, if you compare that to the wild type, most of them survive. So the question then is, can we rescue this phenotype by giving, by giving uh, BP1002 to the renalase agonist? And here we show on this slide, where we uh, inject renalase knockouts with either control uh, BSA or the peptide. And you can see the peptide uh, generates 100% rescue of the, uh, of, the, of the phenotype. So the next step question was, why does that happen? Why, when you have low renalase level, do you die from polyacy uh, exposure? What we found is that renalase turns out to be a very important modulator of the uh, cytokine response uh, with polyacy. As an example, if you look at wild type animals 
and you give them PolyIC. Um, this is, I'm showing you data for IL-1 beta, but that's true for all these inflammatory cytokines. Cytokines go up at two hours and goes down by 18 hours. But if you look at the knockout, the, red, the one in red, uh, cytokines, IL-1 beta goes up significantly by, by many folds at, um, at two hours and then stays up. And what happens is that there's a large um, inflammatory response, and I'm showing you the lung here. So if you look at what, what happens in the lung, NF-kappa B has massive activation, and that's why the animals die. So renolase is an important modulator of uh, cytokine response to viral infection. Then we said, well, what happens in patients? So um, we, we, took a, we looked at about 10% of the patients who had been admitted to year with COVID-19, and we asked a very simple question. Um, does plasma renolase predict mortality in patients? And what we showed first published in, in bio med archive, small cohort of 51 patients. Now we've updated it to 458 subjects and the papers on the review. Essentially what we found was that if you get admitted to COVID to the hospital and you have high renalase level, you do much better than if you have low renalase level. Mortality is much lower. So then the question was then, can we, can we see whether or not BP1002 can blunt the inflammatory response in COVID. So we use an ex vivo method where we take blood from normal patients not exposed to COVID. We expose them to the uh, peptides of COVID and look to see whether or not BP1002 can, can downregulate the, the inflammatory response. And what you see here is that in every single case for TNF alpha, L1 beta, interferon gamma, L6, giving BP1002 downregulates the inflammatory response, indicating that this is, this is effective in COVID-19 and potentially downregulating the uh, inflammatory reaction. Then we moved to a uh, mouse model of COVID where we injected mice with um, the virus and then either treated, treated them with the BSA or renal agonist BP1002. And we found that the animals that received the renal agonist did much better, 80% survival compared to 20% survival of the um, of the animal that are not treated. So here that BP1002 can improve mortality in a severe uh, model of COVID-19 in a mouse model. So what are the advantages of, of BP1002 over standard therapy? So over dexamethasone, BP1002 we've shown does not suppress adrenals and thymus, dex does. And dexamethasone increases the risk of opportunistic infections significantly. Second, what is the advantage of a tocilizumab? Well, BB1002 targets multiple cytokines. It's also a survival factor that actually, that actually presents, prevents cell death. In contrast, TOSI only targets, targets the IL-6 receptor. And then finally, there is a potential for predictive um, therapy. We can, we can measure renalism in, uh, in plasma and predict potentially who, what patient would, would respond best to BP1002 uh, injured. Gary? Gary, yeah. I'm, a, I'm afraid time is time is up. Okay. Can can okay. you summarize the last of the data? Yes, uh, we have an INZ uh, ready for um, uh, quarter one of 2022, and I've already talked to you about that. This is the company. Barry Berkowitz is the CEO, and we'll be happy to talk to you about uh, uh, future funding. Wonderful. Thank That's you like so that. much, Gary. Really appreciate it. Questions for Gary? Do you have to half like extend the peptide or how is it, how is it delivered? So in our studies, we, we can either, either give it IV or sub-Q, either one. IV, uh, the half-life is about 12 hours. So it has to be given uh, several times. And sub-Q, it's about 24 hours. Are there any human genetics around renolase? Yes, there, so there are... Um, a large numbers of uh, single, nucle single nucleotide polymorphisms within the gene. And it's associated with, many of them are associated with hypertension, uh, preeclampsia, uh, diabetes, and, and they, they, they relate to the signaling properties of renal disease. Thank you. And I, I know I cut you off, but when the IND is, has it been submitted? 
Not yet. We are, all the preclinical studies have been done. We are going to do formal toxicity studies and we'll be in contact with the FDA for a discussion about the IND. Okay. We're well, well, well on our way to, uh, to get it submitted. Okay. And, and I, would I would mention that um, the peptide synthesis is very scalable, uh, it's very stable, and uh, we've, we've done significant pharmacokinetics data and it's safe. It does not cause um, an immune reaction. Do you see this as preventing or treating? Um, in other words, if you're already presenting with inflammation from COVID, is it too late? No, actually it's not too late. The, um, the idea would be, I mean, renalase is an anti-inflammatory uh, reagent. What we see in, in patients who get admitted with COVID, very often the levels are high and then they fall. When they fall, patients tend to do much worse. So we could actually predict, uh, you could, we could treat patients with moderately severe uh, COVID or very severe COVID. And in, in the mice studies, we, we actually treat, uh, infect the mice and then wait several days for them to get actually fairly sick and then give the, the peptide. Got it, thanks. Any other questions for Gary? Okay, well, thank you very, very much, Gary. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Nice job. Well, that was a great, that was a great first session there, uh, Catherine. Um, uh, we, uh, we're, we're a tiny bit behind schedule as, as, as is customary for these sorts of events, but- uh, I tried. <laughs> great. If anybody has any sort of any reactions or thoughts, uh, something particular that you'd like to share with the group that uh, kind of reflects something that your firm's thinking about or that like you're particularly interested in or, or, or anything at all that our audience might be sort of interested to hear how VCs view that first group. I guess I was impressed with a lot of molecules that were advanced. In other words, there is actually a lead and there an IND planned as opposed to a screen. So I think that was uh, something that was uh, impressive to me. Bill, it's uh, first of all, great to see you. Um, I think it's really wonderful looking at, you know, clear demonstration of what problem these companies are trying to solve and really patient focused and, and real unmet needs versus a I would say sometimes there's an academic focus so we're solving a really interesting thing but it's not necessarily patient driven and so it's been really nice to see across all these presentations some really thoughtful work on the patient on the actual problem that is a clinical unmet need so that was great and maybe following from that i'd just say that the the quality of the pitches the way they were pitched was really good it's not easy to convey a message in five minutes and so the, they, they had all of the components in a very well-organized manner. Is a real elevator pitch. <laughs> well, yeah. I hope I'm not on an elevator for five minutes though, Jason. <laughs> Fair. We, we put a lot of work into that. And in fact, we've had, I think, well over 300 Yale faculty now have perfected a five minute pitch. So it's, uh, and students and others as well, so. I also really appreciate the the kind of emphasis on genetics and models. I feel like this is sometimes lacking in, in the pitches we see and, and it seems like, you know, either they're presenting them or they understand the biology, the groups understand the biology. So that, that's wonderful. And in many cases, that's that's not true. So it, it's uh, it's good to see that from this group. I mean, just to add to Deb, I think the tie between the, the disease biology and the MOA for the, the drugs was quite interesting for a number of these programs. Just an observation, you know, I, I agree with all the comments that have been made. I think the pitches were very high quality um, and some certainly have good translational potential. You know, the one observation I have is that they're all um, product focused, um, typically single asset which is a little bit unusual, uh, at least for, you know, for thinking about, you know, the, the classic venture backed, you know, 50 million series A company. So I just wonder, you know, if, if folks on the Yale side are thinking about, you know, different financing models and strategies for these companies. 
It's an interesting point. Many of our companies are uh, are, are, are are platform companies, but uh, this this lineup was not. Yeah. Well, if there are no other comments on this, um, Catherine, do you have any closing comment for us before we thank you and move on to our next group? My only comment is just to thank everybody for some great presentations. I really thought it was uh, a wonderful uh, eye opener on, on some level of, of what's going on. And, uh, and I really appreciate it. And thank you for letting me do it, Bill. Oh, well, thank you. We, we really appreciate all your support to all of these investigators over the years. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, so we'll say bye to Catherine and, and, and David Harbiger. Are you, are, are you there for us? Hi, Bill. Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, hi, David. So we're, we're, we're thrilled to have David join us. David's been helping a whole bunch of people over the last many years quite intensely. And, uh, and uh, we welcome him to uh, being here as our, as our moderator for today. I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more and, and, uh, and his firm. And then he can kick off our pitch block too. David, take it away. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, and I see, you know, I'll be brief because we're we had such so much great things to talk about in the first half. I don't want to take time out of these fantastic pitches coming up. Uh, I'm a Yale alumni, graduated from a PhD in pharmacology, and I guess I just keep on coming back because I'm a huge supporter of the innovation that I've seen grown in the past decade since I since I left. Um, and I'm at Greenberg Torek as a shareholder in the Boston office. I'm in the patent group and help companies every step of the way from formation, funding rounds, uh, really providing uh, guiding help through whether it's aligning their strategy with their clinical uh, you know, product development or exit strategy and getting important patents along the way too. Uh, with that, I don't want to uh, take up any more time on myself. The, the, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to transition to the pitches this afternoon. So thank you very much, Bill. I think uh, we're right on schedule um, for the first for the first pitch. Um, if if that's all right, Bill. Absolutely. So Great. Who, 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 so that that would be uh, Jack Talley, CEO of Mito Therapeutics. Jack, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, let's just see. Can you? bring this up and slideshow from the beginning. Okay, can you see and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. I'm Jack Talley. I'm the CEO of Mito Therapeutics. Uh, we come from outside the Yale ecosystem, uh, but uh, are a, a CI invest, uh, investment, and we're focused on a no novel target called uh, MCJ, and uh, we are using uh, RNA silencing basically to treat metabolic disorders. The company was originally founded um, in 2014. Um, MCJ is a regulator of mitochondrial metabolism, which has come uh, recently and um, e even more in vogue. Uh, we are a negative regulator of, myocardi of, of uh, mitochondrial metabolism. So by that, I mean, as you increase MCJ levels, you decrease energy production uh, by the cell. And MCJ is uh, differentially expressed um, in various organs in the body. Um, in particular, the liver and the kidney and the heart are three target areas um, where one sees higher levels of, uh, of MCJ. Uh, this work uh, originally came out of, out of the laboratory of Dr. Mercedes uh, Rincon uh, when she was at Vermont and is uh, now at uh, Colorado. And um, we 
license that technology from them. Um, the idea here is to modulate this protein in order to increase cellular metabolism. Uh, so we're working with uh, antagonists uh, to MCJ. Uh, we have, uh, because there is uh, higher levels of MCJ um, in the liver in particular, um, we started with uh, various knockout models uh, compared to wild type of liver disease. And we were able to show a very consistent therapeutic benefit in terms of uh, lessening uh, liver fat, also fibrosis, as well as uh, 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 in some instances, uh, instances, depending on the model, to uh, promote uh, liver regeneration. Um, all of that, of course, it, it, this is published work. It's all very interesting. But in order to get to a drug, uh, we've been utilizing um, RNA silen uh, silencing uh, to create new drugs here to uh, treat uh, the diseases of interest. So um, we have our own siRNA drug discovery uh, program. Uh, you may know, depending upon the target, uh, that uh, siRNA uh, often requires a delivery mechanism in order to get uh, therapeutic levels to the target organ of interest. And because we are working uh, an awful lot in the liver, uh, we needed um, some type of uh, delivery mechanism and uh, spoke with a variety of companies as it might relate to uh, licensing their technology. Uh, we found them to be um, um, expensive to say the least. And uh, so we decided to uh, develop our own Galnac delivery uh, technology, uh, which we did discover and develop and patent um, internally. Um, where we are currently is that we have completed initial in vivo testing and uh, discovered uh, two lead candidates that have shown activity um, both uh, in, uh, uh, in mice, but more importantly in uh, non-human primates and demonstrated the ability to uh, suppress MCJ. So, uh, MCJ is a platform in a drug, um, as shown on this slide. Um, the lead product right now, the most advanced, is intended for the treatment of, uh, of NASH, uh, which we have been advancing and are currently in IND enabling studies um, and uh, believe we can get to an IND filing by the end of uh, uh, end of next year. Uh, that, of course, is chronic liver disease. Uh, we've also studied this and published on the use of uh, another siRNA in acute liver injury, namely um, APAP induced uh, overdoses or poisoning. Hey, and Chad, sorry, that, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to know we're about at the end of the five minutes. So if you okay. Wanna, um, thank you. Very good. Thanks. Uh, we also have uh, a, a naked siRNA for chronic kidney disease. Uh, we have a peptidomimetic for uh, to supplement uh, CAR T amplification and CD8. And we also have um, uh, a cardiovascular program. This slide basically says we're ready to continue with our TOX program uh, in order to finish the IND enabling activities. We have a unique target that is identified and patented. We are able to enhance mitochondrial respiration and ATP generation without reactive oxygen species production. Um, we can treat multiple metabolic diseases. We have our own delivery mechanism. Uh, we're ready to uh, proceed uh, in NASH. Uh, basically, we're seeking five to $10 million at this point in order to get to the IND and to that phase one program. Uh, we are 
uh, have been notified by the NIH uh, that we are favorably scored for a good chunk of that um, uh, toxicity as well as pharmacodynamic IND enabling activities. And we are currently talking with both commercial partners as well as institutional investors uh, seeking in that Series A. And thank you for your time and attention today. I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jack. And I saw about 40 plus slides in the uh, available deck. So thank you so much for um, you know, uh, such a concise presentation today. Lots of helpful information. And I'll leave the remaining time for the judges for any questions. So I have a quick question just around the um, lead indication, just curious around um, why you selected NASH versus going, going other places. Uh, basically because we uh, had uh, shown a reduction in liver fat um, in uh, various mouse models. And that was, um, where uh, Dr. Rincon's expertise initially was. And uh, we we're working through a beta pathway. So very similar to what uh, Madrigal and Viking is doing um, in terms of comparable companies. Obviously they're in the clinic and we're not at this stage of the game, but we think we can um, um, have those benefits without uh, the ROS liability. And that's, that's basically why we chose Nash and uh, uh, because it works. <laughs> and, and could I ask you for your non-human primate data, uh, what type of endpoints were you looking at? Uh, we were doing liver biopsies in uh, cinemologous monkeys. Um, and basically we were giving, giving them a single dose um, of, um, uh, one, five, or 10 milligrams per kilo. And then uh, we were doing serial biopsies over uh, one month um, and uh, basically looking at the, the health of their, uh, of their livers and any toxicity that we might see. And also, of course, MCJ suppression, so. And, and, and did you look at you know, the liver fat content and that's- Yes, okay. yes, yes, of course. All right, thank you very much. You said you developed a proprietary targeting approach or I guess conjugation methodology, is that correct? Yes, uh, for the liver, we conjugate it with um, uh, our own version of Galnac. We have about 12 of them that we patented um, and uh, basically compared our Galnac uh, primarily to the Arrowhead version of Galnac, um, and we're able to show, um, in terms of, if you're familiar with Galnac, uh, factor 12, uh, uh, that it was uh, equally effective as the as the Arrowhead version. So we felt good about that, and uh, we have uh, patented that version of Galnac. Is well. that anything you're sort of trying to monetize in terms of? Um, it's really, it's very funny that you say that because um, we are in discussions with a, um, a big pharma partner and um, primarily for uh, Nash and, um, and um, without getting, uh, too far ahead of myself. At the end of the last meeting, they basically said, uh, by the way, would you be willing um, to talk about your Galnac as a part of a toolbox? <laughs> and uh, the obvious answer was yes, <laughs> you know, but uh, that's not the primary plan. Thank you. Well, thank you. Th thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people got perked up and got excited about the platform <laughs> options for delivery systems. It's a hot topic these days as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you judges for your questions. Um, I think we'll, sh we'll shift next to Colin Ung, who's a Blavatnik fellow and also an advisor to uh, Atlas Omics. Uh, Colin. 
the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Uh, can you see my screen? See my presentation? Uh, sorry, it's on mute. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, David. So uh, this might be a little bit of a, a, a change of pace from the other presentations, but I'm very excited about the opportunity to talk about Atlas Exomics today. In a nutshell, we're trying to help researchers understand and develop treatments for disease in structurally complex tissue by providing a detailed atlas of the underlying biology. So to tell you a little bit about ourselves, we raised our seed financing earlier this year with the goal of commercializing next generation spatial profiling platform. Our platform DBITSeq was invented by Rong Fan, a professor at Yale University and was recently published in Cell and featured as part of Nature's 2020 Method of the Year. We are backed by a strong team and scientific advisory board who have experienced launching life science technology companies and are industry leaders in system biology. So there's a growing awareness that mapping and understanding the tissue architecture is essential to finding treatments to diseases in structurally complex tissues, such as solid tumors and brain. In the last five years, there's been a significant push to develop better spatial resolving tools to characterize the cell-to-cell -cell interactions that drive disease. This has led to immense insight into potential prognostics and drug targets in neurobiology, cancer, and other diseases that would have been completely invisible without considering the spatial context. Even with this immense progress, existing solutions only allow researchers to look at a very small aspect of the underlying biology. As a, result, as a result, researchers are required to make trade-offs between resolutions, omics, such as proteomics, transcriptomics, and epigenomics, or targets in a given experiment. Often, researchers will run multiple platforms in parallel to build a comprehensive biological story. This approach is time-consuming and challenging to execute when clinical samples are rare or limited. Most importantly, without one comprehensive platform, researchers can miss much of the underlying biology that drive disease. So Atlas Exomics solution, DBITSeq, strikes a balance between all these factors to, to extract the maximum amount of information from clinical samples. The technology uses a combination of microfluidics and next generation sequencing to deliver spatially tagged biological probes directly to the tissue. This allows us to extract transcriptomic, proteomic, or epigenomic biological information from a tissue section with cellular resolution. The beauty of this platform is any type of multiomic probe that can be tagged with an oligo can be integrated into this platform. This allows us to quickly innovate and offer new applications. Our platform has already realized a range of spatial omics, which is years ahead of, of other methods in the field. Over the last year, DBITSeq was published in Cell and Rong's lab has continued to advance the platform releasing several preprints showing the multi-omic capabilities of the platform. This includes the unbiased profiling of the transcriptome, profiling more than 500 proteins simultaneously, and combining the two together to create a multi-omic map. Most uniquely, we recently demonstrated the ability to spatially profile epigenome in tissue samples, which we've received significant uh, interest from, from potential customers. In all, DeepSeq offers a unique combination of cellular resolution, multi-omics, and comprehensive coverage, which we expect to continue to grow into the future. So there's a consensus among leaders in the field that the market for spatial omics will be enormous, as it's hard to find an application where spatial context is not useful. This opportunity has extracted already many new companies, where more than 300 million has been raised by spatial omics companies in the last one and a half years. The current spatial market is currently divided into subgroups of subseller and seller methods, where Atlas Exomics will be positioned as the best cellular resolution multi-omic technology in the market, as we are right now the only platform that offers proteome, transcriptome, and epigenome. We believe that the nature of our technology and our ability to incorporate new omics will allow us to maintain our multi-omic advantage in a very competitive field. So our plan to commercialize is similar to business models as adaptive biotech and isoplexus by, by launching an accessible, like a highly accessible spatial omics product to all that combines user friendliness high and high quality multi-omic data. As part of our seed, we're currently scaling and developing the technology by collaborating with academics to build our brand. Alice Exomics will launch a consumable kit and fee for service that targets biotech and pharma 
to generate our first revenue. Our, however, our long-term goal and really what makes us most excited about the technology is to eventually engage in strategic partnerships with pharma and academia to identify biomarkers for clinical applications. So thank you for your time for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, judges, do you have any questions for Colin and Alex Solmix? Um, question, what's the time horizon at which you'd start partnering with biopharma companies? I think, I think what will, it's probably gonna be at least six to, to six months to a year, but this is one of the things that we really wanna accelerate just because of the nature of the field right now. Because <laughs> if we wait too long, the, 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 train, the, the opportunity will be missed. So Colin, super interesting. Can you walk us through just a little bit of the economics of it, of what you plan to charge, what the typical cycle is to sell into pharma and, and, and kind of how you tie into what the fundraise will be? Yeah, so right now we, we recently re, uh, raised a seed and we're kind of looking for to raise a series A probably by the end of this year, much larger. I think our financing for really our business model for this is we're trying to kind of price it in similar to the kind of the big fish in the field which is uh, 10X genomics right now, and try to match closely to what they're offering as with their Visium products. Um, but mostly what, what we really want to do is, is uh, right now, let's say in the short term, is really about just getting to the academics and getting as many publications out there. Because what we found is that when any time that we've started publishing or even showing off the data, it really is like a natural attraction to customers. So, uh, more details about like the specifics of our pricing and strategy it was something probably more appropriate off offline. Great talk, Colin. Uh, do you have uh, any thoughts on how to reduce noise uh, from the situation of uh, frozen tissues or or FFT generally? So one of the one of the nicest aspects of the technology is that we're we're really a kind of a hybrid fish method in the sense that we're flowing in the probes directly into our tissue. And this process is, is really very comparable to standard uh, immunofluorescent technologies uh, and, and um, uh, fish methods. So we're not, we don't really have the same inherent noise that what you have with other kind of other spatial technologies where you are having the, the actual biological information flowing out of the, out of the sample. So we, we feel pretty good about, um, at least from our initial data, that we haven't had issues with too much noise. But uh, as you imagine, there, we do have bioinformatics solutions where we've been able to kind of filter to get pretty clean readout. And is there a DIY solution possible for academics? For example, can they just make an instrument in their lab to, or, or perform the technique in their lab if they wish to. Yeah, that's actually one of the aspects that we were trying to kind of accelerate or scaling, at least in the near term, where really we have almost like a well-played format where it, the as long as you have the reagents, it's a very simple process. So as long as we can educate the customers, we can actually have them try out their own chemistries, try out their own workflow and actually start building it out. And, and that's very much something that could work for this platform. I think long term for what we'll commercialize, we'll have standardized kits. But I think really in the near term to kind of build kind of our, our momentum, that's one of the ways we can do it. Great, thank you very much judges. And thank you, Colin, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so next we'll transition to Ashley Kalinowski's, Kalinowski, pardon, Kalinowskis. Uh, she's CEO of Torigen Pharmaceuticals. Um, great. Ashley, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And you can see my full screen? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Kalinowskis, the founder and CEO of Torigen, looking to bring immuno-oncology to pets with cancer. And I want to introduce you to Finnegan. Finnegan's a small Affen Pincher dog that was diagnosed with a grade three soft tissue sarcoma. This owner was faced with amputation, but really wanted to avoid chemotherapy at all costs. She was very interested in the ability to stimulate the immune system to help with cancer. And that's really what led her to Torigen. And Finnegan is not alone. 
Each year in the United States, over 4 million dogs and 4 million cats are diagnosed with cancer. 50% of all dogs over the age of 10 will die from cancer, and over 90% of those pets are never seen by a veterinary oncologist, the only veterinary professionals that are able to prescribe and provide chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So this leads to a revolving door where the pet is seen by a general practitioner and they just go through surgery after surgery before eventual metastasis and unfortunate death by the patient um, because of the cancer metastasizing. And we think we can do better. It's our goal at Torigen to really bring immuno-oncology to the veterinary market by making it accessible and scalable. Our first product, Vetivax, is an autologous whole cell tissue vaccine that utilizes a portion of the patient's surgically recepted tumor that gets sent into our labs where we create a series of vaccines aimed at being able to stimulate cytotoxic T cells within that patient against the essentially the patient's own tumor associated antigens. We have eight issued patents on this technology from the University of Notre Dame, but we've been able to expand this technology with two new provisional patents owned by Torigen on really being able to create this into a platform technology. We're able to treat cancer while maintaining the quality of life for that patient. We're first to market and revenue generating. This month in May 2021, we will surpass a million dollar revenue run rate, which is phenomenal as we're about to go out for a Series A financing. We've treated over a thousand companion animals to date, including dogs, cats, horses, and also a few tigers. We've created a valuable patient and cancer database, as well as a tumor bank, really being able to propel ourselves in the veterinary market while making sure that we're always maintaining and being able to show clinical efficacy data that's equivalent or beyond that of chemotherapy. One of the really great aspects of our technology is the ability to create it into a platform. We've been able to look at our technology and find ways to improve it and make it better. One of those has been being able to look at the fact that every dog, cat, and horse is vaccinated against rabies. So we took out the specific rabies virus glycoprotein and tagged that to the patient's own autologous tumor cells. And in our mouse model studies, we're able to show a really great improvement on the overall ability to stimulate both a memory response that's maintained into an active immune response. So this technology was able to go from ideation to mouse models, and we're gonna be launching into clinical studies with this technology by the end of this year. So within 18 months, we've been able to take an idea and run with it. We're able to expand the nearly half a billion dollar total addressable market by being able to give an accessible cancer therapy to veterinarians without additional training. Veterinarians request a collection kit, they send in a sample, and we have about a three day turnaround time for us to get this personalized vaccine back into their hands. The total cost of the vaccine series is $1,500 to the pet owner, and when compared to chemotherapy costing between $5,000 to $10,000 to treat your dog, this is an affordable option to consider. And one of the big things about Torigen is that our main competitor is euthanasia. And I'll let that sit in for a second because it's always so hard to come to that realization that most pet owners after a diagnosis don't have the ability to do anything. It's too expensive, it's not accessible. And while there are emerging companies coming into this field, Torigen is positioning ourselves as a leader. And every patient that we treat, we see as a data point from both the tumor as well as their clinical efficacy data by utilizing our immunotherapy, we really wanna be able to showcase how that data can be leveraged to future research. And that's why we're aiming to partner with early stage human oncology partners. We're, instead of going from mouse to human, be able to have a relevant clinical model in dogs and be able to gather and de-risk an asset for human oncology development. And that's where we're able to position ourselves to be able to grow not only our current revenue, but also future product development revenue through the in-licensing of new technologies. We're a team of cancer researchers, veterinary oncologists, and animal health entrepreneurs focused in the veterinary space, but have aspirations to help human oncology and human therapeutics as well. And we're just about to open our $10 million round to really help accelerate our growth and trajectory and with multiple exit opportunities within the animal health space. So join Torigen and be able to help us help the dogs with cancer. Thank you. 
Great, thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, turn it over to our judges. Do we have any questions? Your example was with um, autologous cell therapy, correct? Correct, that's our current. And so product. when you were talking at the end about expanding, is that with a focus on autologous products or um, beyond that? We're currently evaluating oncolytic virus therapies um, for non-surgically resectable tumors, uh, as well as uh, there's a really critical need for lymphoma therapies as well. So looking at different monoclonal antibody technologies that can have a really great commercializable pathway in the veterinary market. And certain dog breeds which are inbred have a high incidence of specific cancers. Might you have like an off-the-shelf version of that for, can, you know, dog cancers that are very common? That's a really great, uh, great question and great point. So if you came to me with a golden retriever, we can list out the top three cancers that those golden retrievers have. Same with poodles, same with bulldogs. They're because of the genetic uh, kind of deformities that resulted in breeding, that leads to specific cancers having a higher prevalent rate. So by being able to have a, a potentially off-the-shelf therapeutics that have more of a breed-specific focus, that definitely could be an option for us. In order to keep the costs low, being able to provide something that really kind of is, is targeted specifically to that patient, we feel has some really great advantages in the veterinary market um, currently. What's the, what are the COGS for the autologous therapy? Yeah, so we sell it to the veterinarian for $900 for the series of vaccines. Uh, they sell it to that uh, pet owner for about $1,500. And our overall cost to create the series of vaccines is about $153. So we're able to maintain a pretty solid margin on the creation of the therapy as well as um, disseminating it out. Ashley, do you know if the um, therapy is covered under certain pet owners' pet insurance? Yeah, another great question. So less than like three to 5% of pet owners actually have pet insurance. And that number dwindles by the time your dog gets to be about 10 years of age. So being in the vet market, get pet insurance because the costs are, are going up substantially. And for certain pet insurances, we are covered um, by, that, by that. But also if we're not covered for a specific plan, being affordable and being only $1,500 compared to five to 10,000 really provides an option for those owners. Ashley, you may have said this and I missed it. Um, I know you said you've treated over a thousand uh, companion animals. Um, success rate, have you, did you say this already? Yeah, so uh, we have published for one uh, one tumor type in particular is for splenic hemangiosarcoma, a very aggressive tumor that affects the spleen. And we've been able to showcase equivalent survival uh, compared to chemotherapeutic use with the maximum tolerated dose of chemo. And then we are performing additional retrospective analyses of our patient uh, cohorts in order to really be able to pull out additional uh, data and publications. So we really see it as a, a publication stream moving forward of retrospective real world evidence and data to be able to help. But for some of the tumors that we treat that are more of the skin-based tumors that aren't going to necessarily result in that patient's death, those metrics become really hard to analyze if our endpoint is just lifespan. So we end up going with the very most aggressive tumor types and being able to analyze data on them. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. And thank you, judges. Uh, we'll transition now to uh, Dr. Angelique Forday, uh, professor uh, here in the uh, vice chair in research of neurosurgery here at Yale. And she'll discuss a preclinical candidate uh, for genetically defined seizure orphan disorders. Hello, hello everybody, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you and see the slides, thank you. Cool, very good. Well, thank you. I'm excited actually to be able to present one of our strategies to treat epilepsy in a genetically defined uh, patient population. We actually have a small molecule that reduces seizure by 60 to 70% in preclinical studies. So the, where Tim has mentioned, I'm a professor in neurosurgery uh, and I have a cl clinical partners that give us access to hundreds of patients actually when we will be ready to move forward with clinical trials. 
So the disease of interest is tuberosclerosis complex, mouthful. It is a genetically defined lifelong epilepsy disorders. The patient, uh, 80 to 90% of the patients have seizures. They're diagnosed very early on as infants. And um, like I mentioned, the seizures will last for life. Most of them are resistant to anti-epileptic drug treatment. The, reasons, the reason for the seizures is that these patients have brain malformations. And the, uh, the standard of care right now is brain surgery or a drug called Everolimus. Both have limited efficacy and severe side effects. On top of the seizures, the seizure will lead to comorbidities that including insomnia, learning disability, behavioral problems such as anxiety. So there is a really, really high burden for the caregiver and the patients. These seizures are um, dramatic on, the, on daily life. And our small molecule rescued these brain malformation and decreased the seizures. So TSC, tuberous sclerosis complex, TSC is an orphan disorder. However, there's a very high society cost and impact. There's about 50,000 patients with TSC that have seizures in the US. 30 to 40,000 of these patients are drug resistant. And to give you an idea of cost, um, Everolimus, the, the other standard of care as a drug, costs about $16,000 per month per patient. So this is a potential market opportunity of five to six billions. Also, as I mentioned, the standard of care is inadequate. It's brain surgery and everolimus. Not every patient can go for surgery, a candidate for surgeries. And in both cases, the, there is very limited efficacy. Only 40% of the patient respond to everolimus at high dose. So the advantage of having a drug approved by the FDA is that we can use the everolimus clinical uh, trial design and clinical endpoint. The primary endpoint was actually just looking at seizure frequency from baseline for 18 weeks. So we have a novel mechanism of action. We discovered that a molecule called filamine is increased in both TSC patients, and we validated this in different mouse models, including our models, mouse models. That is actually the definite and only mouse model to um, see, um, study seizures in TSC. And this model completely recapitulate the pathology and the symptoms of the human with TSC. So briefly, filamine is actually a pretty large molecule inside cells. It binds actin and has dozens of binding partners. So in TSC, you have mutation, and this leads to increased mTOR activity that is targeted by verolimus. And we found that there's increased in filamine that is targeted by a small molecule. Both together lead to increased cell size, brain malformation, and seizures. And we have data showing that either normalizing filamine levels or blocking its activity shrinks these brain malformation. It's how it reduces seizures. And I will show you the seizure data. So we use a short hairpin RNA against filamine to decrease or normalize the levels of filamine in our mouse model. And we found that it reduced cell size, this abnormal cell size, and it significantly reduced seizure activity. Importantly, we have a small molecule modulator of filamine that when it was given uh, in our mice, either um, in neonates, studying in neonates, or even in adult when the seizure already established, we, this drug was able to significantly reduce seizure activity. So the drug is working and, and uh, through binding to filamine, the, the issue with it is that it's a short half-life of two hours. So we would like to improve the half-life. So we had the lead optimization stage to make novel filamine modulators. So the drug um, has a very well-defined structure at the upper here, and it is well known where it binds to filamine. So we have an, uh, a path lined up straightforward with uh, CRO and EDP, New England Discovery Partners, to, make not, um, to modify that structure and make new filamine modulators. 
we have developed high throughput assays to test that it binds to filamina, and quickly test that it still has efficacy in vitro and in vivo uh, on cell size. We have IP protection from Yale, and we are ready to move from the, once we have uh, efficacy data in animal with these new analogs, we can very quickly translate that to clinical endpoints with MRI and just simply monitoring seizures daily. So we are at this stage of optimization. This is a critical point, an inflection point for us where we really need fundings, about $300,000 to perform some me medicinal chemistry validate some ADME for these drugs, and then select maybe two analogs and do testing on seizures in our model with a CRO that is already in place using our mouse models. Then we can move towards doing more preclinical formulation and confirm the ADME values for these drugs. And that would move us towards a partnership to do final talk studies or a pre -ND and a pre ND package um, to move to clinical trial. So this is where we stand. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my uh, thesis work at Yale it was in uh, related to film and signaling. So many technical questions I could ask, <laughs> but I'll let the judges ask their questions. Thank you. It was a real a pleasure. Thank you. Angelique, this is super interesting. And, and I guess two lines of questions. One is, um, Thoughts around off-target effects of the film and modulation, and, and how do you think about that? And, and I think second question is really around, you know, ever almost definitely has its own issues in terms of safety, but ha have you tried anything in your animal models of, um, will these be additive or, because they're along the uh, same pathway? And so how do you, you view that? And what have you done around, I would say dosing, as well as, um, I guess, maybe therapeutic window with both uh, ever almost and, and treatment? So thank you for the questions, very good questions. So um, we have not detected any side effects for the drug using in animal studying in neonates or just adult. That drug is actually that we're using has been, is undergoing a clinical trial for Alzheimer's disease and there's no known side effect in humans. And it seems that it binds um, uh, a filamine that is uh, a different uh, uh, configuration, um, I'm sorry, configuration in the cells. So it binds specifically a diseased filamine. And we found, we have some of the mechanism of action where we find that filamine goes into the nucleus and it seems to actually block the function on ribosome biogenesis. Uh, so we're looking further into that and that would explain the lack of side effect. Also, filamine in adult has very limited function, and there is a filamine B that could eventually help uh, to compensate for a lack of filamine. So I think there is redundant system in the brain to um, prevent side effect when we target filamine. Uh, regarding everolimus, so we treated our mice with rapamycin. And like in the clinical trial, uh, we found limited, I mean, it worked with limited efficacy in our mouse model, reduced seizures activity when treated in, in adults. Um, we have done uh, only, um, we have done only one dosage uh, of filamine drug on seizures. We know it's not the perfect dosage because um, we had tested on cell size and there's a dose dependence, and we could have tried another dose. We just uh, ran out of time and money or hand power. Uh, so we could improve uh, the dosing of our uh, filamine modulator and make it even more efficient. But already we have 70% decrease in seizures, which has never been seen by the other drugs. Um, in terms of additive effect, Yes, we have not tried. Um, it would be nice to see whether it's synergistic. This is different pathway, uh, mTOR and uh, filamine A. So it would allow to decrease the amount of everolimus, which is really hard on patients. Um, so this is something to explore. We have not looked uh, yet. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Jason, wonderful question. <laughs> it took up the... <laughs> I got to learn some right. question skills from you. You hit a lot of birds with one stone there. Uh, Angelique, thank <laughs> you so much for the presentation. Um, great. And so we'll transition now to uh, 
Jimmy Rosen, uh, CEO of Artisan Biosciences. We can okay. see the slides. Great. Now I can hear you too. Okay. Thank you, David. You're welcome. <clears throat> so I'm Jimmy Rosen um, from Artisan Biosciences. Artisan is a spin out from Yale. Uh, and um, now that we've entered the endurance section of today's program, I'll try to go quickly. <laughs> uh, thanks everybody for hanging on. Um, we'd also like to thank Connecticut Innovations for their sponsorship. They are an investor in Artisan and Elm Street Ventures and Biohaven, also in the New Haven community for their support of Artisan Biosciences. Uh, Artisan is interrogating the human gut microbiome to identify and characterize drivers of inflammatory diseases and develop small molecules and antibody therapeutics to neutralize and ameliorate their effects. And what Artisan is based on is uh, people, there are susceptible individuals who, when they carry a certain microbe in their gut, uh, that microbe is pathogenic to them, but not to others. And so a susceptible person plus this pathobion phenomenon creates the foundation for inflammatory disorders. And uh, these microbial virulence factors have been known to induce uh, epithelial barrier disruption, otherwise known as leaky gut, in diseases like IBD, meaning Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, celiac, certain liver disorders, diabetes, obesity, met metabolic disorders, and certain CNS conditions. And what Artisan does is we identify the virulence factors that are driving these inflammatory diseases we understand their mechanism and target, and then we develop small molecule and antibody therapeutics against them. We are not bugs as drugs, we are drugs as drugs. The founders of Artisan include Richard Flavel, Noah Palm, and Marcel Dezuta from the Department of Yale, from the Yale Department of Immunobiology. Richard, as many of you know, is one of the most cited authors on the planet. He also has a habit of training great students and postdocs and fellows. Noah Palm is now a faculty member in his own right at Yale, and Marcel de Suta has moved back to his home country in the Netherlands. We have support from Hatteras Venture Partners. Uh, John Soderstrom from Yale OCR is a fantastic board member and advisor for Artisan. Holden Thorpe, who knows our science exceptionally well, uh, the editor-in-chief of science in the science family of journals, is on our board. Seth Rudnick, well-known in the Connecticut community as one of the founders of Canaan Partners. Um, and Donnie McGrath from Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, with whom we, re we recently received an equity investment as well as signed uh, development collab a discovery and development collaboration for CNS disorders. Uh, this um, illustration shows you what Artisan does, which is uh, the first thing I want to bring your attention to is these are sections of, uh, of intestinal epithelium. And uh, you'll see the difference between the section on the left and the section on the right at the top, the translucent area, is the mucosal layer. And that mucosal layer in a person with inflammatory bowel disease is thinner than the mucosa of a person with a healthy uh, intestine. That thin mucosal barrier allows bacteria to infiltrate the mucosa and get in close proximity to the apical surface of the gut epithelium where they can release their virulence factors. And the virulence factors that Artisan is working on are known to disrupt epithelial junctions. Uh, Artisan has identified very specifically that target and we're developing small molecules that neutralize the virulence factor and inhibit its ability to interact with that target. The middle panel you'll see uh, is uh, the little green, or sorry, the middle circle, you'll see the little green dots are Artisan's drug binding to that virulence factor. And um, when that occurs, that virulence factor now can no longer um, uh, disrupt those uh, epithelial tight junctions, which once again leads to healthy epithelium with intact uh, and, um, and high and, and uh, 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 gut epithelium um, with intact cell-cell junctions that then allows mucosal healing and can keep those harmful bacteria at bay. Uh, just a little bit of Artisan's progression since its founding. Uh, pathobiont number one, uh, as you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, pathobiont number one is a strain of a common commensal organism, but it, it carries a gene that encodes a virulence factor, and it's the one that I just described. If you knock out that virulence factor and uh, a, 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 there is another strain of common commensal uh, organism that lacks that virulence factor, if you knock out that virulence factor and colonize mice with that strain of bacteria, 
uh, that, um, that bacteria is no longer um, pathogenic. However, if you have the virulence factor present and it, and it is expressing its toxin, it becomes lethal to mice. If you uh, take that same strain and put it into any microbial background, so you take a healthy microbiota from a healthy person and, um, and colonize, you will find that um, it then becomes uh, um, pathogenic once again. Uh, if you put it up against the epithelium in the upper right-hand corner, it disrupts epithelial monolayers. And then where we're driving our value for artisan is, if you take our small molecule compounds, you can inhibit those virulence factors. And this lipocalin 2 um, metric is a measure of, inf of intestinal inflammation. We can ameliorate and neutralize that effect. Uh, as um, Jason Hafler and, and Brian Gallagher alluded to, it's really important to start with the patients and move into um, uh, products. And Artisan has a unique collection of 1,500 um, samples collected from 500 uh, donors into our biobanking program, 300 of whom are IBD patients, 100 of whom are people who live with somebody with, an IBD, with IBD, and 100 are healthy controls. We also received a grant and have a collaboration with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation to develop an antibody against this same target. Uh, so we're driving value at Artisan by, um, we are going to file our first IND at the end of next year. We would be declaring a development candidate uh, this year. And when we go out to raise money in the second half of this year, it will be to file that IND and fund the early clinical development. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, judges, any questions? Yeah, this is uh, Christina. I have a quick um, question. Uh, so you mentioned that you have these, this, you know, really nice uh, panels of uh, human tissues that you're working from. Uh, I guess I'm curious around, um, since it, the, these patients usually uh, have a lot of different um, bacteria that are uh, the issue based on everybody's different microbiome, wondering around, um, how many of those patients do you see with this factor, uh, with that bacteria and with the toxic factor? And then um, thinking about clinical trials, are you able to then uh, find the appropriate patient population uh, amongst these different uh, folks? Yeah, Christine, you're thinking exactly along our lines. And of course, you know our story a little bit. Um, we, uh, so thank you for the questions. Um, the pathobiont number one that I showed explicitly in the presentation is carried by between seven and 10 percent of all IBD patients. We can identify uh, the bacteria that they carry. We can identify um, whether or not they um, have the, the gene that encodes the toxin, and we can also measure the toxin levels in their stool. So when it comes time to selecting patients for a clinical trial, we, um, we are as close to precision medicine as you can get. Yeah. And then um, we have two other uh, lead um, pathobionts that we're working on now for inflammatory bowel disease. And those each are accounted for in approximately 20 to 25% of all IBD patients. Very interestingly, nobody in our sample population carries all three of the virulence factors that we've identified. Um, so you can tell how, uh, how toxic they are and that it's probably not a sur survivable phenotype. Great, well, if there's no further questions, I just wanna thank you very much, uh, Jimmy, and uh, appreciate your time and your questions from the judges. Thank you. Good to see you, Jimmy. Great, uh, with, our, with our last presentation uh, of today, uh, uh, David Colby will be uh, presenting, uh, CEO of Petrogen. David, I can see your slides, thank you. Great, thank you. Just uh, trying to share video, but uh, oh, here we go. Excellent. Great. Can you see me? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for uh, hanging in there. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, you know, uh, I just want to congratulate all the uh, presenters today. Did a great job and uh, really impressive technologies that have uh, moved along a lot as an EIR at Yale. I've seen some of these technologies grow over the last couple of years, and it's just very impressive. So congratulations to everyone. Really great work. So, um, you know, I'm the CEO of a company called Petrogen. We're focused on novel therapeutics for periodontal disease. 
And uh, we were founded in August of 2020, um, started some fundraising at the beginning of this year. Sorry about that. And um, closed about a million dollars in March. Expect to finish our, our seed round of $3 million in the next month or two. Um, the biology in, in our company is really developed by uh, Demetrius Braddock and his lab. And it's also the basis for the uh, Yale spin out uh, Inazon, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. And um, we're projected to file our IND in the next 12 to 18 months. So, um, you know, everything starts with a really good team. That's obviously very important. And uh, we believe we have some, some really good folks uh, in terms of having expertise in our target biology, uh, which is uh, specifically the enzyme ENPP1. Uh, in periodontal disease with our partnership with NIH um, and experience founding successful university spinouts with uh, good exits, uh, my background as well as Demetrius's. So, you know, our, our mission, right, this periodontal disease, it's not sexy, it's not, um, you know, a really uh, key problem like Alzheimer's or, or even, you know, uh, uh, cancer for dogs, but it's still a very important problem. It's a very big problem where there's no disease modifying therapies. So, um, starting on the left side, so what's the disease? So the disease is measured by pocket depth between the periodontal ligament, also known as the gum, and the tooth itself. So that pocket is measured in millimeters. And usually if you have five millimeters or more, you're in the moderate to severe periodontal disease categories. And that comprises about 34 million people in the U.S. alone. And we estimate that's about a $5 billion market opportunity. Now, if you don't treat periodontal disease, um, there's lots of issues that come with that. Um, you need implants, which can cost $10,000 and usually is not covered by insurance. Um, there's nutritional issues, especially in the older population, because you've got pain, you've got inflammation, you're not too keen on eating, and that becomes a big problem. And then there's a number of other diseases that have been implicated um, downstream of periodontal disease uh, as well. So whether it's chronic kidney disease, respiratory diseases, uh, even cognitive dysfunction. So, so I guess we do touch everything, you know, all the other stuff everybody else touches. <laughs> so um, what's standard of care today? Um, it starts with a procedure called scaling and root planing. They take a, uh, this probe that you see here, they scrape away between the tooth and the gum and clear out any debris and calculi and, and bacteria. And if they do a good job, um, they'll end up seeing a benefit of about one millimeter. So again, one on a, you know, sort of five to seven or even seven millimeter or more pocket, you know, sort of a 10 to 15% benefit. And the cost of that is about $370. Um, in terms of therapeutics, there's really only one therapeutic that's in use today, and it's minocycline. It's basically an antibiotic. Um, the clinical benefit is really um, almost nothing. It's, it's about a third of a millimeter of a benefit based on their clinical studies, and that costs about $87 per tooth. Um, interestingly enough, Arrestin used to be a product that was owned by Johnson & Johnson um, at about 100 and, $140 million or so. It was uh, sold to a private equity shop that flipped it to what's now known as Bausch & Lomb. And today, the, the, uh, and they acquired that company for about 450 million with milestones and everything else. And now uh, the company does, again, still about $100 million in sales. So how did we get here? How did we sort of get to periodontal disease? Well, um, it's kind of serendipity, actually, because, uh, you know, Demetrius Braddock was working in his lab focused on something very important, rare disease, uh, a rare disease specifically called general arterial calcification in infants, where they have a mutation in this, in this enzyme ENPP1 which leads to overcalcification in the body. So, you know, unfortunately these uh, infants are born with this mutation and it leads to calcification of arteries and the heart and all different things. So one thing he did notice um, was that in their teeth as well, he noticed that there was a buildup of a material called cementum. Cementum is sort of the, the material that is the foundation of holding the tooth and the gum together, the periodontal ligament together and keeping that in place. And so if you look at the bottom left panel, you see a thin layer of cementum, this yellow over here, and then in these rare disease patients, the GACI patients, you see a much, much thicker layer of cementum on the order of 15 to 20 times more cementum. <clears throat> so immediately you saw this human proof of concept that could be a potential therape therapeutic for periodontal disease and decided that was you know, a potentially uh, exciting opportunity and brought in the NIH and their expertise in periodontal disease and their models. And that's what led to the work on the right. And this is one example of several mouse models that have been done where again, the yellow is the cementum and if you look at an ENPP1 knockout model on the far right, you see much thicker layers of cementum, this yellow here, versus a wild type mouse where you've got these thin layers as well. So that was very exciting as a potential therapeutic. So really our story is very simple, right? The idea is to provide this, this phenotype, but locally, right? So we're gonna inhibit ENPP1 locally in the pocket of the tooth, and this will drive up the production of cementum, as we saw in the previous slide, and that will lead to disease modification and ideally restoration of the, of the uh, clinical attachment 
of the periodontal ligament to the tooth itself. So, um, you know, in a nutshell, what do you need to remember about us? So, you know, right now there's ineffective standard of care. Um, you know, really the, the therapeutic provides, you know, less than a, a third of a millimeter of improvement in pocket depth. Uh, the procedure, the, the scaling and root planing is about a, a millimeter. Uh, every time you repeat it, you lose the efficacy and you can't really repeat it very often. Um, we've got knockout in terms of our target knockout proof of concept in you, both humans and animals. We've got known inhibitors in hand. We're, we're right now optimizing those compounds to declare a lead um, by the end of this year. We have an IP portfolio that's building on method of use, composition of matter, formulation, and dosing. It's, a, you know, again, a $5 billion opportunity, and we use that uh, based on pricing of Arrestin. So we didn't even assume a premium to that. Um, there's also a very big animal health opportunity. There's about 40 million dogs in the U.S. alone that have periodontal disease. Um, so we think that's an amazing opportunity as well. Um, and we've actually been talking to the, the second largest animal health company uh, and getting their feedback as to what the product should look like, how often should it be used, and, and maybe even create a, a preventative, a prophylactic product for uh, periodontal disease in dogs. Um, we know the regulatory pathway. We know the endpoints. Um, there's a limited capital need for us. We, we don't think this is a uh, you know, $100 million program. We think probably with $30 million, we get to uh, you know, um, strong clinical proof of concept, uh, you know, phase two data. And, um, and we think that's, you know, near term next few years. So we're very excited. I hope I did that, uh, you know, as quickly as possible to get you guys out of here on time. So I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, David. Of course. Fantastic. Judges, any questions? Is the, is the teeth, in other words, the only interface where this um, happens or is it other interface with bone and other tissue? No, no. So it's only in the tooth. So we're putting it in the pocket between the, the tooth and the gum and the periodontal ligament. I see. And so it's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's only a local thing. It's not systemic. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't I expect see. to see systemic um, availability Effects. of the drug. Okay. Correct. Okay. And who would you sell to? It would be to dentists or oral surgeons? Uh, who's the yeah, customer? So so right now, um, right now, dentists and periodontists both place Arrestin. And since our product will be almost identical in terms of, of the actual procedure, dropping in these microspheres into the pocket, um, there's no training required. I so see. basically, whoever's doing it now, whoever's doing Arrestin now could do this. It's just going to be better efficacy is what you're thinking. Correct. I, I think at the end of the day, what we, we know what it looks like in humans, right? We know when there's ENPP1 inhibited right? We know what happens with the cementum in the tooth. So all we're doing is trying to replicate the biology we've seen already in a specific area. And when we do that, which we've already proven in some of the animal models. So once we do that, we're expecting that the cementum will grow and refoundation that tooth. So you'll, you'll have a complete restoration. So we think it's, it's really a binary situation. Either it's not going to work at all, or it's going to work and restore the whole tooth. There's really, it's not a matter of, hey, did we get one millimeter and they got a third of a millimeter? It's, it's not, that's not the game. It's either going to work biologically and restore the, the tooth or not. And are and we'll you know thinking very quickly. And you're thinking about competing on efficacy, not on cost or anything like that. In other words, is it potentially cheaper or more expensive? Oh, it's not, it's not even a competition, right? Their products are bacterial, it's an antibiotic. Right. So they're, they're really, they wouldn't even tell you they have any proof to show why they improve, you know, the pocket. So it's really, as a matter of fact, we wouldn't necessarily tell people not to use Arrestin. Feel free to use Arrestin too, if you'd like. Right. I see. It's a whole different product. Correct. Correct. Exactly. We're, we're about restoration and closing that pocket depth. They're about preventing reinfection, which is perfectly fine. Yeah. And do you think the, they'd have to do the scaling first and then, and then put this in? Yeah, I think, I think they do scaling regardless. So I think that's, that's always a procedure they do. So for, for two reasons, I say that one is, you know, I hate to say it this way, but financially, I don't want to take $370 away from the dentist or the periodontist. And two, I think at the end of the day, um, it's important to clear that anyway. So if we build cementum, even if they haven't cleared it, let's say we could still build cementum even on top of the debris probably not the best idea. So we let them clear it out first and then we do that. Yeah, so that's the idea. Okay. Do you have a sense of how long you need to maintain target coverage to see a meaningful restoration of cementum? We do, we do. So we've seen, already in mouse models, we've seen it takes about two weeks and you get a buildup of cementum. Now, how that translates to humans, um, we'll know when we, we're in clinic, 
but we know that, you know, it's not years, right? So we know that. And we know that if you sort of compare um, sort of, you know, physiologically the pocket of a mouse and then the pocket of a human, right? I mean, I don't know if you could use sort of body surface measurements like you would use for oncology or for whatever, but it, it, it's not years. It's, you know, weeks or maybe a month. Great. Well, I was about to say that's time, but Carlo, I'm glad you got that question and interesting answer. David, thank you, thank you. very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, that can, Bill, I think, uh, you know, pitch two session is concluded and uh, wow, what a fantastic group. Uh, I'd like to thank all of those participants. Um, Bill, I'll pass the mic to you. Yeah, uh, th thank you to all 12 pitchers uh, today. Uh, fantastic job. Uh, it's hard to, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's easier when you're in the big auditorium at Yale and all sorts of people are smiling and clapping when you're done. It really gives you a boost. So it's uh, virtually, you don't get the applause that you sort of, but uh, I think uh, we can, uh, we can give them all sort of our virtual applause. It was a fantastic job. And thank you to all of the judges for the, the good questions specifically on each of them so far. Um, and to you, to those of you out in the audience, um, you know, just a reminder that yeah, some of these things are pretty early. A couple of them are a little farther along, but uh, we just, uh, last night we looked through uh, previous uh, companies or ideas for companies that have been right here pitching at the Innovation Summit. Um, we, add up, uh, we add up 12 companies that have gone on to raise $400 million in venture capital. And those are companies whose very first pitch or very first meeting with an investor was right here at the Innovation Summit. So, um, so, if you have a crystal ball, some of the ones you saw today are going to be successes in the future. Um, and some of those, and three of those 12 companies have products in the clinic. So, um, so it's up to our judges to guess which ones are the next, uh, the next. And I open it up for discussion with them. What's happening out there in the industry? What do they think? Uh, what do they think uh, that they heard today in terms of themes or ideas that uh, our audience would appreciate hearing their insights? Who wants to kick us off? We're all, I'm gonna call on someone. Um, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to to uh, to chime in. I mean, I think um, all kinds of uh, use of let's say big data and tech uh, to help with drug discovery and development, uh, clinical trial enrollment. It's kind of an, an interesting space for us because it's not the same as as mon being able to model like how much you're going to make on a therapeutic. But I think that everybody is applying these approaches. Um, and if they don't, they're not going to be competitive, you know, using real world data, those types of approaches. We haven't seen any of that today because it was therapeutics. Um, uh, and that being said, I think other things related to um, ways, obviously, of continuing to use, let's say, precision medicine and, you know, individual patient profiling to, to funnel them into the exact, um, you know, appropriate treatment. And I'll, I think all of those things are are continue to be on the horizon. And then things like total frontiers of science, um, areas that have to do with, um, uh, you know, looking at, at um, cells with uh, organelles within the cell, not just the cell itself, and understanding how drug discovery uh, can use really high, uh, you know, uh, intracellular imaging to understand what's happening inside cells. So those are some areas that are, I think, new, you know, hot areas and also frontiers. Radio conjugates uh, using uh, radioactivity, which of course in the olden days was viewed as too toxic, uh, is becoming much more popular, alpha emitters, for example, um, and using uh, those conjugates to treat cancer. 
That, that's great to hear. Um, I, I will note that uh, tomorrow you will see some really cool things with data analytics. It's a big area of focus and investment for Yale right now, making a number of many hires and, and, and investing really in the infrastructure for, for Yale to be uh, um, you know, preeminent in the data analytics area for, for medicine. So stay tuned for that. Hey, Brian, what sorts of things is Abingworth interested in these days? And uh, what did you see that might fit with that? Hey, thanks for calling on me, Bill. Uh, <laughs> you're, um, you're enjoying I mean, the sunset yeah. there, so I thought I'd... I mean, we're, we're, we're generally um, you know, fairly agnostic with regard to indication, um, but where we think that there's a lot of opportunity, I mean, we're still doing investments in oncology, but to be honest, it's a very crowded space. And so showing differentiation is a, is a key before we'll make an investment there. Um, but you know, I think that the areas of uh, immunology inflammation are still very ripe for uh, opportunities. There's still a lot of unmet need. Um, a lot of interest in the industry, I would say, and, and for us, personally in uh, the neurospace, um, as some of these diseases are, the biology is becoming clearer um, and the ability to, to drug them um, becomes a clearer path. I think that that um, starts to become much more interesting. And, and certainly we, you know, we've heard from, from our pharma colleagues that we've spoken to that that's an area that they are very interested in. And we, we heard some of that, you know, some of these ideas today. Um, and then, you know, I guess Carlo had made the comment or, uh, after the first block about you know, a lot of single sort of single target, single asset. I mean, I think that's true and there's nothing wrong with that. That appeals to a certain set of investors. Um, and we do some of that type of investing, but we also, generally prefer platform companies. And so, you know, technologies that are truly differentiating in drug development, drug discovery, I think are areas of interest that, that we are particularly interested in. Uh, Bill, we have one question in the chat. Can I go ahead and... Um, Unmute, Frank. Um, sure. I just want to say thanks. I've actually have a hard stop now, and, and just this is just really great to see all these friendly faces. I wish we were all together, but maybe one of the nice things about these virtual panels, we can get people from the West Coast and uh, like Allison and some others that we might you know not be able to see. So it's uh, much appreciated. I look forward and hope we can do this in person next year. But uh, great format, great much better panels besides me on here, but great to see everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, Frank, Frank Chavalino is out there somewhere with a question. So let's, uh, let's let him ask, where are you, Frank? Michelle, you wanna turn him on? Okay, he had a hand raised. Tim, can you go ahead and unmute Frank? Usually we have people walking around the big auditorium with the microphones trying to get over to the, to the person with the question. So I just here. did. Okay, Frank, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, hi Frank, go yeah. ahead. Bill, I, I don't know how you got my name as a question, but I'm sitting here listening, but I did not have a question. Oh, I, I saw I saw something in the chat that said uh, that said Frank had his hand raised. I don't know how it got in. All right, well you accidentally I did not have a question. There it is. I you you accidentally hit your raised hand button. I guess is that right? Okay, I might have done it accidentally. That's possible. Okay. Um, any other thoughts or uh, or, or comments from our our panel? Um, yeah, maybe I'll just, um, you know, you asked about what we what we get excited about and what we look for. 
Um, and, and we saw several of these today. So I just want to highlight this. You know, I think for me, particularly for the very early builds, it's usually a technology um, advance or a or a biology insight. And I think we saw a couple of examples today, um, in particular novel mechanism of actions on indications that are well-trodden, but no, not successful yet. So um, this sort of stuff gets me very excited to, to see that these types of pitches that really focus on the technology advance or technology insight and biology insight. So again, just wanna thank the group. This is exactly the, the types of things that get us excited. Yeah, and, and I wanted to follow up with that one quite, one comment for the entrepreneurs here. Um, you know, Deborah mentioned build. Uh, it takes a few shots to put that build together, so don't be discouraged. I think you know the heroes today are the presenters, and they probably presented it uh, you know <laughs> a thousand times. But um, you know, to make that to make a, a build takes a lot of listening, creativity, and grit. Um, you know, so uh, you know, keep keep on chipping away. We need it. That today's a celebration as far as I, I can see it. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think we actually have some results coming in from our audience voting. And uh, so I'm told that the, uh, the, uh, the audience choice award for pitch block one is Erica Smith um, and but Erica might not be on anymore because she actually had to go into another meeting. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm at the airport, but I made I made it. Thank you so much. Pull it off. All right. Congratulations, Erica. You've done a fantastic job, and our audience agrees. So we really hope you can uh, help help those patients. And uh, you know, this is exactly why we're doing what we're doing. So. Thank you for including me. Very much appreciate it. Great job. Thanks for being here with us today. And um, for Pitch Block 2, our Audience Choice Award is, is Ashley Kalanakis. Ashley, are you out there? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Today, So very cool. Uh, you captured the imagination of the audience. Uh, maybe they're like, like me. They have some couple dogs that they want to care for and and uh but really cool lot uh, really cool company you got going so um thanks for being with us today and um and uh i'll remind everybody that the sort of there will be more prizes that will be awarded on friday after our judges um each kind of let me know their top three picks for uh, most exciting company, sort of irrespective of what stage it happens to be at. And um, there's a couple things to remind the audience about. You know, the Summit platform, you can go there 24 seven now. There are over 90 pitches. You can watch pitches. If you saw something you like today, the slide decks are there. Information about how to contact those entrepreneurs and those teams. Um, if you haven't found the program book for the conference today, um, that's over on the left side. And uh, it's really great. I, I just sort of was looking at it myself and it really, our team did a beautiful job on that. Normally I love bringing those printed books home, but so we're, we're, we're saving trees today and only sort of doing it virtually. So go, go check that out and enjoy that. Um, thank you to all of our sponsors, uh, and you can you can uh, learn more about all of them uh, on our on our platform and in our program book. Um, I encourage everybody to join us again tomorrow, same time. We have a whole different lineup of judges and uh, companies in the med tech space. Uh, the data analytics space for healthcare, um, uh, devices, um, a lot of very creative uh, companies, um, uh, sort of with some very new technologies. Um, and I think with that, I've done everything I'm, I'm supposed to do. Um, thanks everybody for participating today and I encourage you please come back and join us tomorrow um, 
And then Thursday, we have a whole nother slate of uh, biotech uh, therapeutics that are all in the oncology space. Uh, Friday is a full day of activities with a career panel for uh, younger people who are coming out of postdocs or grad school or whatever. And then uh, a series of panels about uh, why we do what we do and the impact that we can have uh, on patients and uh, building up our New Haven cluster. And then a whole bunch of fun uh, awards to hand out, including awarding this year's Blavatnik Award. So please everybody come back and join us uh, this week. Uh, thanks so much for your attendance today. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Bye. Thank you, Bill. Bye. Thanks, Albert. Everybody appreciate it.